I wasn't here. We'll see how uh, your sub slash uh, Julia did though. And we'll do Renaissance, Exploration, Climate Exchange, Mercantilism, Tokugawa, Japan. Hopefully we got enough time to do all that. We'll try. All right, let's start with the Renaissance. So this is actually the first period two topic. All right, so period two, 1450 to 1750. All right, and we're gonna start with the Renaissance, which means, anybody know? Rebirth. Yeah, rebirth of what? Of who? Europe. Europe, there you go. You're like, uh. All right, they were stuck for a while. They were in a rut called the Middle Ages. Uh, the Enlightenment people, Enlightenment folks called it the uh, Dark Ages. Uh, and they were stuck because they were more or less controlled by the Catholic Church. Uh, they were not unified under stable, uh, centralized empires. So there was not a whole lot of innovation or security or economic development. It was mostly just try to live in your kingdom and try not to uh, piss off the church, pretty much. Uh, however, a bunch of information is going to come back, trickle in to the 1300s and 1400s, especially the 1400s, um, as a bunch of old information is going to return. And you, I heard you cover it several times uh, with Julia. But um, this old classical knowledge that's from Greece and Rome, uh, there's a lot of things. So there's two primary qualities that you got to know. One quality is most of it is going to be relatively uh, secular, which might be a new word for you. I'm not sure if they covered that. Secular means non-religious, all right? So they're not focused on Christianity and going to heaven, and uh, they're not focused on the afterlife. They're focused on this life now. Anybody know why? Maybe the old ancient Greek writers and some of the early Roman writers wouldn't write about Christianity. It didn't. It didn't exist, right? So it's kind of hard uh, for them to write about that. So a lot of it, a lot of the writings are going to be secular, and also we're going to get. Uh, we'll talk more about that one later in the year when we get to AP Euro. But uh, also, they're going to bring back an old way of thinking that root, was rooted in the Greeks and later the Romans. Greco-Roman yeah, skepticism is what I was going for, but yes, yeah, Greco-Roman logic. Right. <coughs> Remind me of what skepticism is. Thinking. Not just thinking. Questioning everything. Yeah, you're questioning the authority figure. And I don't mean authority. Like, yeah, I'm your teacher and technically I, I enforce the rules, but... I mean authority as in knowledge. Like, uh, uh, your teacher is an authority figure in knowledge. That means they know what they're talking about. They know the subject. All right, so authority can mean, yeah, I enforce rules, but it can also mean, you know, uh, I have this set of knowledge, so you should listen to me because I know what I'm talking about. All right, so they're going to just basically question knowledge and authority on knowledge, uh, and that's going to uh, lead them down a uh, road that eventually gets to the scientific revolution, which we'll briefly talk about here. Before that, though, as these things start trickling, trickling back into Europe, uh, I want to know the three primary ways they did so. How did they do this? Can anybody name all three? Oh, um, well, the Mongol, the Silk Road trade. Yeah, the okay, so trade, Silk Road, Mongol Empire, uh, reestablished that in the uh, 1200s and 1300s. Trade, okay, what else? Um, the Crusades. The Crusades, nice. Black Death. Black Death, uh, that's not what brought back texts. That's what decimated the population and improved labor for the few that survived in living uh, uh, quality of life. There's a third one, though. It's actually a European, not civilization, but uh, polity. It's a trade-based one in the Mediterranean Sea. Yes, okay, mostly Venice, but yeah, so uh, Mediterranean trade, basically. So Venice, uh, they're going to be the primary instigators of this. But yes, a lot of trades are coming through the Mediterranean with the Arab world, and those documents and knowledge are going to trickle in. That was left there long ago by Alexander the Great and the Hellenistic Empire. If you remember way back to, like, Unit Zero, when we briefly talked about the first week, the uh, Greeks went through and built libraries and put their Greek knowledge into all these cities throughout North Africa and the Middle East and even into Persia and Central Asia. So that's where it was preserved because they lost it in Europe. Uh, and that's going to trickle back uh, through that um, means from those areas. Okay, cool. Uh, quick about the Crusades, though. I feel like probably nobody told you about what the Crusades are, correct? Yeah. Oh, so you know the basics then. Okay, well, I'll just go over the basics real quick then. Uh, Crusades, 
this area is the focus. This is where uh, three major monotheistic religions uh, originate, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And all three religions want to either control or have access to it. Uh, so in the uh, 11th century, so the thousands to, uh, I think the last crusade was like 1291 or 1295, something like that, to basically 1300, you're going to have a series of crusades from the Europeans as they're going to put together what they can as far as forces go, you know, commissioned by the Pope, and they're going to invade, and they're going to occupy uh, territory there. They actually chase out uh, a lot of the uh, Muslim uh, empires that are, that are present, forces that are present, and they're going to hold on to decent chunks of territory for a couple hundred years before they run out of funding and the uh, uh, Muslims sort of unite and chase them out. Uh, but why would we care about that? How, how, how does that impact... Uh, European history, except for the fact that it makes Muslims and Christians dislike each other. Attention, Spartan students. Christopher Jomel, please come to the office. Christopher Jomel, please come to the office. Oh, she's done. Okay. They brought back some of the skepticism that was in the area. Yeah, some of the knowledge and documentation they came across, you know, in Jerusalem, those other cities, Antioch, etc., uh, and they would bring it back. So those are all ways that it's going to trickle back in. Okay, cool. So a lot of that gets in. But uh, this trade that's established is also going to bring things besides knowledge back. It's going to bring some technologies and some, uh, I guess you would say, production methods. All right, there's one that's really important uh, because they're going to turn this knowledge into the printing press. All right, uh, and who's going to be my inventor of the printing press in the uh, uh, 1400s? Johannes Gutenberg. Yeah, Johannes Gutenberg. So he is going to. I believe the print technology, I, the ideas behind it came from China, but they didn't make a printing press, at least not like he did. Uh, he's the one that finalizes it into an actual printing press. So uh, Gutenberg, in the, I believe it was the 1400s, I think it was the 15th century, we'll just write it to be safe. Uh, he's gonna invent the printing press. Why do, we, why do we care about this? Why does that matter? Okay, later for the Protestant Reformation, super important. Yeah, definitely, we talked about that earlier this week. But before the Protestant Reformation, how was this thing already making an impact, even in the 1400s? It allowed for like, the spread of the language. Like, um, yeah, okay, cool. So this is, uh, this is actually the equivalent of a communication revolution. So the latest one we've had would, you'd probably say, uh, like the Morse code telephone was huge for us. Uh, not us, because we weren't alive yet. But uh, then you also have the internet, that one we were alive for, or actually no, we were, you guys weren't even alive when that became a thing. So you've always had the internet. But not even a generation ago, uh, the internet's brand new. So that's a, a, a new way of communicating. The printing press is like that big back then, because it used to be you'd have to write things by hand. It would take forever to write anything. Now though, you just print a template, you make a template, which takes a little bit, but you just keep printing pages. You just dip it in ink, boom, dip it in ink, boom, dip it in ink, boom. Uh, and you can make pages that are exactly the same very, 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 very quickly. All right, so this is a major development uh, that's gonna impact, yes, the Protestant Reformation, but even before that, the development of vernacular languages, which again are like formal, common ways of speaking. So all those dialects of English and Spanish and German are all gonna be uh, organized into uh, a fixed gra grammatical set. So the, the way I'm speaking right now was not the way all English speakers spoke, you know, uh, several hundred years ago. But after we have some very influential literary figures come along and sort of establish a formal way of uh, speaking and writing in English, uh, we have that. So we've at least covered three examples of vernacular language uh, that was established. So vernacular language. We've got English. We've got Spanish. We've got German. So who are my, let's go English first. Who's the guy that really codifies that? And Shakespeare. Yeah, Shakespeare. I mean, other people contributed too. I don't think it's just these guys, but they're the, the primary um, contributors, or at least initial. Um, Spanish and Miguel Cervantes. Yeah, Cervantes, all right. And for German. Luther. Yeah, Luther with his uh, German uh, publication of the Bible, nice. So that's going to spread and develop languages. Uh, but more importantly, this is going to allow knowledge to spread much more quickly. So we get some ideas coming back, and now these ideas that have returned can now spread uh, throughout all of Europe. So we've got many more people that have access to this. Information is actually critical uh, when you're trying to 
develop an economy or technology or innovation or, or anything. Uh, so this is going to be, this is what causes Europe to sort of wake up. You have the whole rebirth thing because they were just doing essentially nothing for a thousand years except for just staying the same. Uh, but this influx of information and this ability to communicate, that's really going to allow them to, uh, to uh, expand their knowledge and then later their economies, technology, all that stuff is going to follow. So this is like the trigger right, that starts with the spark that starts it. All right, so you with me on the Renaissance and its significance? All right, sweet. So this, along with another development, is going to allow the Europeans to become super wealthy. All right, uh, so this is gonna enhance their knowledge and later innovation and technology. Uh, but another thing's gonna make them rich and powerful. Uh, they're going to, well, what are they gonna do? What's gonna make them rich and powerful? What, what is this era I am referring to? The age of exploration. Yeah, age of exploration, correct. So let's first talk about why they're even doing that. So exploration, which is uh, roughly late 15th to uh, 15th to, uh, at some point in the 17th century, you'd probably say exploration <laughs> ended. They haven't charted the entire world yet, like a lot of Africa was uncharted and the Americas, but the phase where they, they pretty much claimed all the land they could at the time uh, by, by the uh, 17th century. So exploration. First off, though, we got to know why. Why do they uh, have to find this? Well, they want to connect the Indian Ocean, all right, because that's where the money's at. And uh, wh why do they need to like do this whole kooky exploration thing to find it? Like, why don't they just go trade with like everybody else? Because of the Muslims. Yeah. So there's two reasons why. Uh, they are blocked by the uh, Muslim caliphates and sultanates. Uh, block Europeans. They are not friends, especially after the Crusades. All right, so most of this territory, which is the uh, areas in which they would traverse, are blocked by either Sunni or Shia uh, empires uh, at, at some point, okay? Well, why can't I just do the uh, Silk Road and connect to China like the old days? The Mongols had already fallen. Right, yeah, and so there's not really an established uh, Silk Road anymore because the Mongol Empire that kept it running uh, is no longer there, and that Silk Road also falls apart with it. So they've gotta find their own way. Uh, to get there. So they choose to sail, and uh, there's two different ideas. Both of them work. One works better than the other, but both of them end up working. The Portuguese are here on the Atlantic. Uh, their idea is to go around Africa, which is possible, and they do it. It takes them a while, but that's going to be their goal. Uh, so they're the first ones to start this, and they start sailing and charting the uh, coast of Africa. Before we talk about who did it and how and all that, I need to know also so this is their motivation. What technologies are going to, or innovations are going to allow them to do this? Because nobody, except for the Vikings, has really gone out and consistently explored on a large scale like this. So you could say that, you know, Tseng Ha did, and oh, that's kind of at the same time, um, with the Ming Dynasty in the Indian Ocean, but no one's really just kind of gone out and charted and explored all this new territory and, and, and established connections with that, other than pretty much the Vikings. And maybe the Phoenicians before. Hmm? Maps. Yeah, okay, cool. So we've got uh, portal and maps, which allow them to uh, uh, chart and, you know, what are, what's portal for? Not rediscover, but uh, form routes, consistent routes, because I gotta be able to go back to where I was for it to be a settlement. All right, so portal and maps. Who did, did they, did the sub or Julia explain how uh, portal and maps worked? Yeah. yeah. They did? Okay, well the compass and timing the sailing and all that? Okay, perfect. All right, just to summarize, you just use a compass to sail in a straight line, you time it, and that gives you a good idea of the distance. And they would just do that from various points, and they could make pretty accurate maps uh, back then. They wouldn't look exactly like our maps now, but they're close. All right, what was the other one you said? Carabelles. Carabelles, that's right. The uh, much more efficient and quick uh, ships that could go long distances, but also could maneuver well. In fact, they could maneuver super well, they could stop and turn much more quickly than other ships because they had an additional piece added to it. I don't know if this is in the notes or not. No, that's an older, uh, although they do use those, uh, that's an older, like, classical era. This is, this is brand new. I, I believe it was Europeans that invented it. If not, they're the ones that popularized it. I forgot the exact name, but isn't it like on, almost like a motor or whatever? Close. All right, it's not a motor, but it does guide the ship. It's called a stern post rudder. And that's going to allow them to uh, stop and turn much more quickly. So there's areas they can access more consistently 
uh, that aren't as dangerous. Like if I'm just floating in by rocks, like it could just send me into the rocks. Uh, with the stern post rudder, they have a lot more control of the direction my ship is going. All right. Um, I already mentioned the compass. Where's that come from? China. China. Yep, China. And how did they know how far north and south they were? They were they used a way, I believe the Arabs either invented it or popularized it, about how to know, based on the stars, how far north or south I was. Astrolabe. Yeah, astrolabe, nice. And one last thing, no, actually, no, not the last thing. They also are going to catch on to a couple of wind patterns that help them explore through Africa and then eventually go across the ocean to the Americas. What are those two wind patterns? Um, the westerlies and trade winds. Yeah, westerlies and trade winds. Yeah, there's a rough uh, wind pattern. In fact, actually planes still use this because it's more fuel efficient. Uh, and it roughly goes uh, down the coast of Africa, across the equator into the Caribbean, and then kind of goes back up to the United States uh, and back over to the northern part of Europe. So those are the westerlies, those are the trade winds. Uh, and they're going to use those because the water's already flowing that way. It makes a sailing ship uh, much easier to, to uh, travel with uh, using those currents and those winds. Nice. All right. How were they able to conquer um, peoples of the Americas so well? I'm not talking about the disease yet. How were they able to conquer people of the Americas so easily or uh, the coasts of Africa or India or wherever they show up at the time? What's the advantage they're going to have over most of these areas? Uh, gunpowder weapons? Yes, they have much more developed gunpowder weapons. They exist elsewhere, at least around that time, but the Europeans, for whatever reason, as they're metalworking or, or whatnot, like some people think it's because they made so many church bells that they knew how to work with metal better, whatever it was. Uh, they're going to master the cannon first, all right? And they're going to put that on ships. That's a huge advantage. It used to be you could only take ships out by like running into them and boarding them and, you know, chopping people up, but no, now they can sink you before you even get close to them. That's never happened before. So, like the Battle of Ponto or Battle of Dieu that we talked about, where they fight against the Ottoman Empire, in both cases, they're able to destroy much larger navies because they have these cannon ships. Uh, and more importantly, they can uh, take over entire towns without invading. They can just sit off the coast and say, hi guys, go ahead and surrender or we're just gonna blow all your buildings up. Uh, and usually they say no, and then they blow some buildings up, and then eventually they surrender. Uh, so they can actually take over coastal towns, they can destroy ships before they can get close to them. Uh, this is a massive, massive, massive advantage over here in the old world when the Europeans get there. All right, cool. So guns and gunboats, well, I should say cannon ships. <coughs> also, one thing that really catches the Native Americans off guard is going to be horses. They don't have those. so. Uh, Warriors on horses with guns, that's, that's a no contest, um, even without the disease. <clears throat> Although they definitely needed the disease to do it because there's just way too many, they would have been outnumbered way too much. Not enough bullets, even if they could beat them. All right, and then horses. Cool. So, Portuguese, the first ones to start this, they start charting the coast of Africa. All right. Who's going to be funding this? Okay, they actually fund um, Columbus, oh, which we'll get to. But uh, who starts the funding? He's, I, as far as I know, he's the first major contributor uh, and funder of these voyages. Henry the Navigator. Yeah, Henry the Navigator, who actually didn't navigate himself, but whatever. He's going to fund a lot of these um, voyages for the Portuguese as they attempt to sail around Africa. Not as easy as it sounds, by the way. On a sailboat, I can't just sail around the... Uh, uh, the tip of Africa here. Uh, the way that the winds and currents work, it'll just send you right back, as far as I know. So the Portuguese had to figure out this kooky way of catching different currents and then catching the Antarctic current uh, to swing back up uh, to actually get through and around it. Um, they're actually going to protect that for like several decades. It's like punishable by death to tell anybody who's not Portuguese about it. Uh, but eventually, uh, some Dutch kid that's like a hired hand on the ship, like figures out how they do it, and then he like logs it and sends it to uh, 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 the Netherlands and England, and then everybody knows after that. But for a while, they protect that with their lives. All right, so who's the first person, by the way, to make this trip around and connect with India? Vasco da Gama. Yeah, Vasco da Gama. He's going to uh, be the first European to uh, make a direct <laughs> connection with uh, the Indian Ocean Trade Network. He actually, of course, sees the Swahili city states before that. Uh, but he's going to be the one that connects with India, specifically Calicut and all that. All right. Before they get there, though, I kind of skipped a step on accident. 
they're going to establish the beginnings of their own maritime empire here in Africa, right? And just like I mentioned, because they have gunboats that can sort of take whatever town they want, uh, and they do that over here in Africa. And they're gonna form this connection in these what are called trade post empires, because they don't go inland, they can't go inland. The empires are too big, or in this case, tropical disease will stop them and their horses from taking over. So they stick to the coasts. But what are the Portuguese gonna establish here later that's gonna be uh, terrible, but very important for the development of um, the Americas later on? The slave trade. Yeah, the slave trade, right? So they're gonna establish these uh, port trade cities, this trade post empire, and the West African empires who have already been trading slaves, the Arabs, for 500 years. Uh, they're just gonna say, oh sweet, you're just a larger, richer group who shows up at our doorstep and wants to buy uh, slaves, and they have plenty, and they go find more if they don't, uh, by conquering other um, tribes or kingdoms and using those prisoners to sell as slaves. So West African kingdoms are gonna be selling a lot of slaves. The Portuguese, who are gonna bring them on over. Almost all slaves were uh, put into Brazil and the Caribbean, um, and then only a few ended up, like 10% or less, ended up going to actually United States. But anyways, get a little ahead of myself there. Vasco de Gama connects, Henry the Navigator, funds a lot of expeditions. <coughs> How do the Spanish, uh, what's their strategy? So I wanna know, yeah, it's Christopher Columbus, but like, what kind of sailors were hired for the most part, and why? Just before I even go to the Spain thing, I think you were first. Italian sailors, because they had previous knowledge of sailing. Yeah, these Italian sailors, like Columbus, had already been sailing the Mediterranean for hundreds of years, uh, whether it's Venice or Florence or somebody else. Uh, they have experienced sailors, so they're the ones that they hire to go on these voyages. Columbus, of course, is Italian. Uh, but he was hired, somebody else already mentioned it, by Ferdinand and Isabella of um, Spain. Right after they just united Spain, they just kicked out the last of the uh, Moors, the, um, the leftovers of the Umayyad Caliphate that had been there in united Spain. Uh, and they're going to fund Christopher Columbus. And that was a common theme, was using Italian sailors because they were uh, experienced. You guys are doing good. Looks like uh, Julia and the sub did a decent job, at least so far. All right, um, so where was I going with this? What their strategy was. What was that? What their strategy was. Okay, yeah, oh, yeah. What, what, what was their uh, intended strategy? Sail around the world to get to Yeah, and they're right, you can do that, but there's something in the way they didn't know about, which of course is the entire set of continents, that is the Americas. Um, and that's actually the misnomer, the mislabeling of the peoples of uh, the Americas. That's why they were called Indians, because he literally thought they landed in India uh, when he got there. Uh, he's just like, oh, look, they're pretty brown. They must be Indian. <laughs> so he named them Indians. They've been misnamed ever since. Of course, now they've adopted the name American Indian, which is more accurate. But uh, yeah, that's how they got mislabeled by, um, by Christopher Columbus. OK, so he establishes that connection, makes it back, and uh, informs Spain and others find out. So we get a lot more voyages going out there. Uh, but the first two empires to really set out, explore, and claim most of this territory is going to be, which I've already mentioned, Portugal and Spain. So Portugal is going to get a lot of these trade post uh, empires. These aren't exact locations, by the way. I'm just randomly choosing them. Um, in the old world, though, in Africa and Asia, they're pretty much going to be limited to just the cities on the coasts. So I, can, I think I already mentioned it, but why, why just the cities on the coasts in the cases of uh, the Portuguese. The land, the land empires are too big compared to what they had. Yeah, they didn't have nearly enough funding uh, to send enough troops to try to take over an empire. And in some cases, like in Africa, uh, tropical disease would either kill the Europeans or their horses, and they couldn't really go into the interior at all anyway. Uh, but they could take over towns by just blowing them to smithereens until they surrendered, which they did. All right, so we've got the uh, Portuguese. They establish a, what type of empire? I think I said it already, but. Trade trade yeah, trade post. So that's basically coastal cities and ports. All right. Now the Portuguese, this is the big joke for Europe initially, they have nothing to actually trade. Like all these places have like spices and silk and tea and porcelain and the Europeans like, we have some wool. <laughs> oh, you already have wool. Uh, we have some bread. Oh, you already have bread. They didn't really have anything. I think one of the bigger things they had was honey for whatever reason. Uh, not a lot of air, other areas had a lot of honey. But for the most part, the Europeans had almost nothing to trade. So how did the Portuguese go about making money? Because they had to make money off of doing this, and they did, besides the slave trade later. 
they forced the people and merchants in the Indian Ocean to pay a car tax? Yeah, exactly. It was kind of like a trade tax. So they did one of two things. They either require you to pay them to use the ports and trade. That was called the cartas or cartas. It's basically, it's basically like a trade certificate or a, a, a or tax. And also, they would be the ones that would facilitate the trade, meaning they would be the ones that you hired to transport the goods. They weren't, it wasn't their goods, but you were paying them as the middlemen, kind of like how Venice did between Europe and uh, uh, the Byzantine Empire and the Mediterranean. All right, so they were the middlemen of the uh, Indian Ocean trade network. All right, so that's the Portuguese, and they established that over here in the Indian Ocean. Spain, though, goes a much different route. What is their empire going to be like, and where, for the most part? Conquest based. Okay, meaning? Um, meaning that they take the land. From who? From the Indians in Africa. Okay, and what's going to allow them to do that? Now, yeah, they have an advantage of horses and guns, but like I said, there would be way too many American Indians to take by force back then. There's something that's going to help them out and do that. Yeah, European diseases, all right? Now, they don't, it's not like chemical warfare and they're or biological warfare and they're doing this on purpose. It's on accident. They don't even know about immunities. But because these people have been separated from these people for 10 to 20,000 years, we had developed immunities to what? Diseases we got from animals. So most of the diseases that plagued people back then, like smallpox, measles, etc., those weren't human diseases. Those were given to us by animals. So over time, lots of people had died from those, but the ones that lived had immune systems that were able to survive that disease. So after a few generations of people dying from smallpox or measles or whatever, the only people that are left are the ones that might suffer, but they're more likely to live, all right? So even though I get smallpox over here, I have an okay chance of living uh, because for whatever reason, genetically, my immune system can, can fight it off. However, these guys never had any access to that. So when the Europeans come over with these smallpox and measles, which are already embedded in humans, and that Europeans are largely resistant to, uh, the Native Americans have no resistance to it whatsoever. So it just wipes them out. Like 90 plus percent uh, die from this. Like the Spanish had no idea. They went into like, the when they met the Aztec uh, in Tenochtitlan, uh, Montezuma II, they went in and they just basically met them and like, oh my gosh, we're never gonna take this. There's like 200,000 of these guys and they're very militaristic and we're just, it's not gonna happen. And they come back a few days later and like almost everyone's dead. And they're like, oh, well now we can take it. So, and of course, as you guys already know, uh, nobody liked the Aztec because they were so brutal, the people they conquered, sacrifices and you know, uh, uh, enslavement and all that. Uh, so the Spanish were able to do it uh, because of disease and the fact that the Aztecs did not have any friends. Similar to the Incans, when they take over them, disease wipes them out, and the Incans are already fighting each other, so uh, they didn't have to do a whole lot. All right, so Spain. No, I'm out of room. I'll put it right here. Spain, conquest-based. And they're able to do that because of disease on accident, and uh, also, I would say, internal conflicts. So those American Indians, whether they're Aztec or Incan, they either had a civil war going on or everybody that was ruled by them just hated their guts and was waiting for them to uh, be weak. And so they pounced on them. All right, cool. What areas, that's a tough question. I'll just give it to you. Spain is going to claim most of the Americas very quickly, like way faster than they can actually settle it. But Spain's gonna claim a good chunk here all the way up to eventually by like 1763 or so. They're gonna own pretty much all of this. Like just Spain. That's a huge <clears throat> amount of land. Massive amount of land. Lots of resources there. Silver, gold, um, all the new crops that come across. Uh, so Spain's gonna become quite wealthy. And then Portugal is gonna claim Brazil as well as their trade post empires. Now initially, there's a lot of competition between the two over who owns what, how much they could grab. Uh, but somebody's going to settle that dispute between the two and divide the world in half. Who's going to do that and what's it called? The Pope. The Pope? But what's it called? The Tribune of Tortillas. Yeah, there we go. I was, I was hoping you'd say tortillas. Somebody said that one time. <laughs> I was just like, nice. All right, so yeah. Uh, it's going to be uh, split. This competition is going to be uh, split or ended. Ended by Treaty of Tortillas. 
There's another treaty too that split it by the Philippines. I can't remember what the name of that treaty was though. It was a little bit later, regardless. Uh, treaty of Tordesillas, man, the internet people are gonna hate me because there's no way they can read this. They just have to listen well. Uh, treaty of Tordesillas is gonna be what sort of ends the competition between Spain and Portugal, both Catholic countries. However, there's three other countries that join the uh, exploration fray and they are at least partially Protestant or entirely Protestant? What are these three Atlantic states? Let's go with somebody who haven't, you haven't said that many. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Netherlands. Netherlands, which are the Dutch. Who else? England. England France. and France. Nice. They're going to join a little bit late, though. So what's open for claiming at this point? The northern part. Yeah, the northern parts of the Americas, right. So Britain's going to run in and get what is now, you know, the eastern coast of the United States for the most part. Um, they're also going to take Hudson Bay. Joke's on them, there's nothing there. Oh. Maybe there's oil, but they weren't using it back then. Uh, the French, oh, they also have the New- Newfoundland area. The French are going to take you know, the St. Lawrence River, Great Lake area. That's going to be known as Quebec now, French Canada. We'll learn about that later in the uh, year, because they're actually trying to become their own country since the 1960s. They're French-speaking, French-cultured, and they do not like being a part of um, English-speaking Canada. Anyways, and then the Netherlands are going to, you know, nudge in there wherever they can uh, over time. All right. Um, Is that pretty much all that was said about those Atlantic states initially? Okay. So what's going to happen over time is these two empires, the Portuguese and the Spanish, are going to decay. There's multiple reasons for that, which we'll go over, at least for Spain. Uh, But the people that are going to sort of What's the word I'm looking for? Pick up the scraps and benefit are going to be mostly the British and the Dutch. Uh, the French will too, but mostly the British and the uh, Dutch are going to benefit uh, from this slow decay of Spain and Portugal. Like the Dutch and the British are going to take a lot of holdings in the Caribbean, which becomes super, super, super lucrative, wealthy uh, because of the sugar trade. Uh, they're also going to take parts of um, Central America, like Panama, uh, Belize. Uh, what is now Suriname, things like that and on these coasts. And the uh, Dutch and the English are going to largely control the Indian Ocean pretty shortly as well. They're going to kind of kick out the Spanish, uh, or sorry, the Portuguese over time there. All right, that's a long process, though. That's like a 100, 150-year process. So don't think it was just like, boom, they just went and took it. They just slowly crept and took those things away. So before I talk about how they did that, and mercantilism and all that, Let's quickly talk about the Columbian Exchange, because it is, it is a major topic on the AP World Test in the past. So you definitely got to know what it is and its impact. All right, so Columbian Exchange. It's a pretty simple one, actually. It's just the exchange of goods and animals and diseases between the old world, which is Afro, Afro-Eurasia, and the new world. Uh, which is North and South America. All right, so what are some goods that Europeans were able to discover and bring back to the old world that people were willing to pay a lot of money for or were super calorie dense and boosted their population? I'll take either one. Go ahead and try to give me two for each person. Uh, Corn, potatoes, and tobacco. That was three, but yes. (laughs) Nice. Uh, Beans and squash. Nice, okay. Do you already get the important ones? No, there's one major one that Europeans really liked uh, that also has a bunch of caffeine in it and got them addicted to it. Not coffee, by the way. Coffee's from the old world. All the hands go down. No? (laughs) Yeah, cacao. Nice, cool. So, from the new world to the old world, we have... There's a lot, but I'm gonna list the most important ones. One that either ones that either made Europeans super rich because everybody wanted them because they were addicting, like chocolate or sugar or tobacco. Uh, but oh wait, no, I think sugar was actually already in the old world, but they planted it there. So <clears throat> take that one back. Tobacco and chocolate, though, are new world goods, and they're super addictive. The nicotine uh, and the caffeine in both, and just the fact that chocolate's so sweet is going to be uh, very addicting, very rare, very expensive, and it's going to make these Europeans really, really rich. Okay, cool. So, tobacco, corn, potatoes, all forms of them. Um, what did I just mention? Oh, cacao, chocolate, or the 
brute form of chocolate. And should we talk about anything else? Tomatoes. Uh, I mean, I mean the Italians like them, but that's not really going to change the population. But yes, the fact that tomatoes are in things is is a result of this. Okay, these two, corn and potatoes, are going to actually increase the population here because they are calorie dense. Uh, they're relatively resistant to um, uh, drought and, and other sorts of plagues that more easily kill other crops like wheat. Uh, so corn, a lot of that's going to be fed to uh, their livestock and animals. So if I have more animals, that means I also have more milk and meat too, which is more food, which is more people. Potatoes, especially in China, sweet potatoes, they're going to boost population quite a bit. And in Northern Europe, it's really going to help them out until the 1800s when there's a famine and Lots and lots and lots of people die. <clears throat> so that's how the population is going to be affected. We're going to have population growth in the old world. Why do we care about tobacco and uh, cacao? What does that do for people in the old world besides taste good or be addictive? Uh, it gets them rich. It does get them rich. So the people that get a hold of this first, the Spanish for the most part, and then later, of course, the uh, uh, British and, and, and Dutch and even Portuguese, that's going to be a very addictive, very luxurious, expensive commodity that's going to make them very, very, very wealthy. So they'll bring it back and they'll sell it here in Europe and make a bunch of money, or they'll sell it to the African kingdoms that they're trading with, or anybody in Asia that they can uh, connect with. And that's, they finally have something people want. So they finally have goods that people want to trade for, right? So that's going to allow them to really expand their uh, trade networks, I guess you could say. <coughs> All right, and this is the first time too, we have the first global trade network. I mean, there was some Vikings that brought lumber back from the Americas like 500 years earlier, but that, that had no impact. This is the first one that actually impacts populations. Okay, so those were mostly good, at least for people of the old world, especially the Europeans. Um, what about the uh, shift the other way of old world goods uh, to the new world? Definitely some positives, but definitely some negatives too. Um, disease, livestock, um, citrus fruit, <laughs> let's, let's stick to the ones that are uh, that really impact those societies. Like those things taste great and they help against scurvy and all that. But like, I'll, I'll say disease very impactful because it wiped out ninety percent of the people in the Americas that were that were native to the region. Livestock because that's going to allow them to uh, utilize animal labor, uh, domesticated labor, domesticated animals. Uh, what else? Slaves. Slaves. That's a big one too. Yeah, that's later, but yes. Sugar. Sugar, that's a big one too. Not that it impacts the uh, peoples of the Americas as much, but when they get over here and they've got all this open uh, territory that's you know well watered because it's tropical regions and whatnot, sugar grows super well there. Uh, so they're going to take a lot of that sugar that would only grow in a few regions over here and grow it like crazy in the Americas. They're really going to commercialize it. Did I ever tell you what commercialize means? Yeah. Okay, to sell for profit. Okay. Uh, grains. And yeah, grains, cool. Yeah, that, we, we can cut it at that. So grains and coffee. So the uh, things that are going to be brought over and produced and sold for gigantic amounts of money are going to be sugar and coffee. So these four are going to be like the staple commodities or goods, actually the luxuries, uh, that uh, is going to really, really start to enrich the, uh, the Europeans. All right. Uh, there's also gold and silver, too. The Spanish are going to find a couple very, very condensed or, or dense uh, silver mines. One's in Peru. They find another one in Mexico and later in Nevada. Uh, I believe the Peru one was first. It was almost, they called it just a silver mountain because there was so much in it. I think, I think they're still mining it, not like they were before, but I think there's actually still some silver in there that they're, they're extracting. Uh, obviously, Peru is doing it now, not the Spanish. But uh, yeah, so we've got silver, gold. All of these are going to... Uh, impact the economies and populations of the, of the various regions. So obviously here, the impact is going to be uh, mass, not extinction, but mass death. So population is going to decrease. That's the impact there. What happens to the population here? Increase. Why? Uh, Calorie-dense food. Calorie-dense foods, right? And then, of course, more food for their animals, too. All right. And uh, who's enriched the most by this? Spain. Okay, but I, I was going for Europeans, but you're right. Initially, for sure, it's going to be Spain. Uh, but yes, Europeans just in general. Spain at first, uh, but all the others can be enriched by this as well. Cool. So you guys understand the Columbian Exchange? 
All right, so what I'll probably do is explain, I'll probably explain now, we got another 15 minutes left. I'll explain mercantilism and triangular trade and the encomienda system. And then I'll, I'll, I'll have a couple more topics to, to talk about tomorrow, and then we'll focus on this week's content for the rest of it, so you guys have a refresher with the quiz on Friday. Question? What about Chicago? What? What about Chicago and Japan? Yeah, no, we'll, that's what we'll cover tomorrow, briefly. The only topics we'll have left is uh, uh, Tokugawa, Japan, and then a little bit about mercantilism. Maybe I'll explain the whole thing, I don't know. All right, cool, so, moving on. Colombian exchange. So that's going to enrich the uh, Europeans. And what topics did I say I was going to cover? Mercantilism. Triangular trade on Comiandus. That's right. Okay, cool. So we'll do Comiandus first because that's chronologically more accurate. So the Spanish get over here, right? And uh, they're going to be like, they're going to realize the opportunity they have. They can really harvest a lot of these crops that are already over there or that they're bringing over to make money. They can harvest, or sorry, mine the silver and the gold. There's a lot of money to be made, but they need a ton of labor, right? We don't have machines back then. It's just, you're gonna be, it's gonna be animal labor or human labor. Uh, and if it's complicated, it's gonna be human labor. All right, so initially, they're going to be using uh, these Native Americans uh, that are there. But uh, first, let's talk about how, how they took over, I guess I would say. So there's a, did you talk about conquistadors at all? Okay, cool. So there's a bunch, but there's the primary two that I want you guys to know. So Spain is going to, of course, conquer and settle a lot of this area, but they're not rich yet. So it's not like Fernand Isabella can send the Spanish army over and take over a bunch of territory. They're going to rely on a bunch of basically motivated, risky, single men to do it. All right, so these are guys with no families that uh, probably aren't really well liked because they're so willing to leave their civilization uh, and risk their lives to go explore, uh, settle, and conquer an area. Uh, so these are people who are what you would consider maybe almost like middle or upper middle class today. They're like lower nobility. So they're not nobles that have a lot of power, or authority, or prestige, uh, but, they're, but they're not peasants either. So these are, I guess you'd say, lower nobility. Not for long, though. Uh, and they're going to be called conquistadors. All right, and the examples I gave you, what were the two examples I gave you, you guys remember? Cortez. Cortez, he's the one that conquers the Aztec. Pizarro. Pizarro conquers who? Inca. Inca, yeah, Inca Empire. All right, so, and that's just two examples of many. Uh, we'll stick with them, though. So we had um, uh, Pizarro and Cortez. So Aztec and Inca, and like, like we already mentioned, they're really, really, they're aided by the fact that disease wreaks havoc on the populations, and then these, most of these empires have a bunch of internal civil war or discontented populations that are gonna make it easy to do. Here's the kicker though, and this is why they're so motivated to do it, especially after the success of Cortez and Pizarro right off the bat, uh, is when they conquer this land for Spain, because they pretty much did it on their own dime. They got some funding, from others, from the, from the uh, um, monarchs, but not much. It was pretty much just them and the soldiers they hired and had with them. So the reward was, what do you think the reward was? Land. Yeah, they get the land there. And they're made the lords of those uh, territories. So that land grant, and they're massive, by the way, that they get, they are, have control of the people there, and they also have uh, control of the resources there. So that's going to be a major motivation for lots more conquistadors to come out and try uh, most of them end up failing because they like show up and then march off in a direction to conquer it and then all they find is like desert and they die. Uh, but some of them succeed. All right, so the reward is uh, land grants. I would actually say estates because they're actually technically made like uh, nobles. And this system in which they're granted land and titles uh, is known as the Comienda system, yeah. All right, and coming into system. So the uh, title for these conquistadors, who are lords of this area, are called <coughs> encomienderos, eros, sorry. And um, they're technically, 
the feudal heads of the estate, manorial lords, and the natives that are underneath <clears throat> them are supposed to be under their protection. They're, they're supposed to do two things, protect them and convert them to Christianity, uh, sometimes by force. So they do that, but there's going to be a bunch of individual mines and plantations and things like that on these encomiendas that are going to generate a lot of wealth for them and for Spain. What are those called? Haciendas. Haciendas, yeah. Nice, okay. Haciendas, and these are going to be, of course, driven by human and animal labor, mostly human. <coughs> and they start out with, uh, well, the Incans already have a good system. They have the Mita system, so they're like, well, we'll just use this. It's already organized. So they start using the Mita system in the Inca Empire, and they basically just use uh, American Indians to do a lot of labor. But that doesn't last long. Why doesn't that last long? Disease. Yeah, disease. Their, their population gets decimated. So very quickly, they have to shift from using the Mita system and uh, American Indian labor uh, to uh, finding other means. So one of the first ones they try is <clears throat> hiring poor whites to do it. So we've got people in Europe that want to get the hell out of there because it's too crowded or there's too much disease or there's not enough economic opportunity or there's religious wars or all of the above. Uh, so they want to escape so they don't well, suffer and die. But they're not money. They can't get over here. How are they going to afford their trip across the ocean? And then, of course, what are they going to be called? Indentured servants and they uh, like potentially pay off for their trip by working in yeah, they're, they're kind of like a voluntary slave. It's not as bad as a slave because they don't own you, but you essentially contract years of labor. So it's like, we'll pay for your trip, but you have to work for us for free for seven years or, or whatever, right? And that kind of works. Indentured servitude. But it's tough, especially when the English try using it up here because uh, Europeans look very similar, right? They're all... Like any ethnic group, the, the, the skin tones between them are relatively similar. So it's pretty easy to go to an area that has very few people in it, very little what you would call maybe police or government, uh, and, and to keep people there because they could just leave. I'd be like, I get over there and I'm working on your farm or your plantation or whatever, and then uh, I just walk off one day. And is it going to be easy to track me down? No. no. There's no roads or documentation or police force, and there's just <clears throat> hardly any Europeans over there yet at all. So many of them would just would be like, all right, peace, and they would just go somewhere else out of their range and start their own farm or encomienda or plantation or whatever. Uh, or sorry, hacienda, not encomienda. Uh, so uh, that was a big problem. A lot of these indentured servants would just peace out and then go make up their own farm or whatever later on uh, in another area. However, they found a workaround. Their workaround is the, of course, uh, terrible development uh, of bringing over uh, West African slaves. And again, they didn't like apprehend them for the most part. Uh, they were sold to Portuguese uh, merchants and slave traders from these African kingdoms. And the Portuguese then brought them over. Uh, they would compact them in these ships like sardines. Many of them would die from um, um, uh, complications, dehydration, disease, uh, all, all kinds of factors led to their death and dismemberment. Uh, so what was this treacherous voyage across the Atlantic called when they were packed in like sardines like this. The middle passage. Middle passage, right. So it's going to be replaced here with uh, West African slaves. And that journey is known as the Middle Passage. And that's going to fuel a lot of these, um, uh, of this, this need for, for human labor. Most are going to stay here in Brazil, in Portuguese Brazil, you know, working on <coughs> coffee plantations and things like that. Another large portion are going to go to the Caribbean to work on sugar plantations because they're all very labor intensive. Uh, and then, like I said, about 10% or less end up eventually going to the United States or what is now the United States. Uh, and that is the slave trade. All right. So where we get the name Atlantic system or triangular trade is it's not just a one-way uh, arrangement. Right. So you do have the purchasing of slaves from West Africa and bringing them over to work here in the Americas. But it doesn't end there. What's the next step of this? So you bring over slaves to work, you make more stuff, you make more profit, what, what goes on? You sell them back. Yeah, that stuff goes back to Europe to be sold, and then they make more money, they make more money too. And then what do they do with this money and this profit? Buy more slaves. They buy more slaves, right. And now we have, I know my map doesn't look very good for it, we have what's called triangular trade because it's a, it's a, it's a process. It's a three-way, a three-point, it's almost like a circular thing, but it's a triangle. 
uh, because it keeps going in this direction and growing and growing and growing. More slaves go over, more stuff's made, more profits made when they sell it, and they buy more slaves, and they keep that process going for a few hundred years, um, a little over 200 years. So that is what we call the Atlantic system or triangular trade. We got that? Cool. Now let's just do, I won't do Mercantiles, we'll do Mercantiles tomorrow. Let's just talk quickly about the Spanish racial caste system, because that's another big topic on um, Asian world. They, they love topics like that, where you have like, um, I don't know, oppression or racial issues. So we always talk about them, so we know them. Okay, so the Spanish, this is not going to be incorporated in non-Hispanic territories, at least not like this, um, not so explicitly uh, and uh, definitively. But in the Spanish territories and the Portuguese too, but mostly Spanish, we have what's called the Spanish caste system. Now if you guys remember, the caste system in India is like a hierarchy, right? Mm -hmm. And how do you move in that hierarchy? Not in your lifetime, right? You can't move, essentially. It's the same here. But instead of them basing it on social class or your job, they base it almost completely on the pigmentation of your skin. All right? Uh, there's one exception, of course, it's Europeans that come over from Europe. But for the most part, this is a racial caste system in which you are either denied or given opportunity based solely on your parents and how you look, for the most part. All right? So, uh, again, it's a racial caste system, and it's going to be fixed, right, because you, you, at least back then, you couldn't change the color of your skin and your appearance, so whatever you're born with, that's your, your class, uh, that's your, at least your spot, in the tier in the hierarchy, uh, and you're stuck there. All right, so it's a fixed uh, social hierarchy. All right, I, I can't change, I was born into it, which is a terrible system, but anyways. So... <coughs> Any system that's fixed like that, whether it's race or social class or religion, it's just a, it's a, it's a terrible idea. It's not how humans actually function. All right, so at the very top, now while they might not be any darker or lighter than some of the people on this list, they are still put at the top. Uh, now these are Spanish or Portuguese people that were born in Europe that came over. All right, so the, the issue is where they were born for some reason. All right, so that's the very top. These guys have all opportunities. They're going to have first claim to all positions of power uh, in the military, in politics, whatever. Uh, and what are, what are they called here at the top? Insulares. Insulares, yeah. Right, and those are Europeans born in Europe. Because for some, for some reason that makes you better. I don't know how. I don't know any of these things they thought were better, but this one's particularly confusing. It's the same race, just born in a different spot. Anyways, below them are Europeans born in the Americas. All right? Yeah, Creoles. So that's Europeans born in Americas. All right, and now we start getting more uh, complicated, and it's, it's almost solely based on your pigmentation at this point. It doesn't matter where you were born necessarily. All right, so just below them, you're going to have uh, the uh, mix. This isn't, by the way, this isn't, well, by the way, this isn't every single tier, but it's, it's the primary ones. So uh, below them is going to be a mix between uh, Europeans and Native Americans, known as? Mestizos, yes. European and Native American mix. All right, and below that is going to be, actually, I can't remember if it's, no, no. Love yes, love so that's going to be European and uh, African, black African mix. All right, I, I wasn't sure if the Native American came before that or not, but yeah, so um, mulatto. That's going to be European and um, African. All right, and then below that, it's going to be Zombos, Zombos which is the uh, Native American and African mix. And that's more or less their tier. Now, they did shove, from what I remember anyway, um, a pure-blooded American, Native American, and I believe the very bottom was a pure-blooded uh, West African slave. But that's going to be the uh, caste system. And the reason why we know about this, number one, is don't put your stuff away yet. The reason why we need to know about this is not only is it a, an example of a, an oppressive racial hierarchy, which it totally is, um, which is the Enlightenment's just going to annihilate later on. 
But we care about this because there's a particular group that is, well, they're all oppressed except for the Peninsularis, but there's one group that feels particularly upset by this hierarchy because they're the same race as the Peninsulares, but they're just born in a different spot. Uh, and as time goes on, there's going to be more and more and more and more of them and less and less and less of them. Uh, and of course, they're the Creoles. So what you need to know is that as time goes on and more and more European families settle over here in the Spanish regions, like, do they go back to Europe? No, no they stay there and they increase their population. So as time goes on, I have like ridiculous ratios of like 10, 20, 30 to 1 of Creoles outnumbering these Peninsulares. All right, and they're gonna be like, why the hell are you guys in charge? Like I've been here for generations. I don't even know what Spain looks like. I've never seen the king, I don't care about him. Why do I have to pay taxes to and listen to you just because you were born there? All right, so that's going to later on in AP World inspire uh, a lot of nationalistic revolutions. It's being led by these, uh, this Creoles group who basically are tired of listening to people in a king they've never heard of, been to, uh, and are an ocean away uh, for no reason other than that's where they were born. So we're going to have a lot of nationalistic revolutions uh, from roughly 1820, starting in Mexico, till the 1830s, where basically Spain and Portugal are, well, at least in the Spanish territories, they're kicked out of this entire area. Uh, and new countries are formed like Argentina, uh, Grand Colombia, Mexico, etc. Uh, and that's going to be started by this Creole group. Guys, you got it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mbola. Oh, it's a coco. Yeah, I'll look at that too. I'm going to do Merkelism first, and then I'll do, because um, that kind of explains why they're in Japan. And then all of a sudden, the Europeans. And then uh, we'll talk about Japan and the uh, Sokoku era. So, um, the Europeans, they've already, we talked about colonization as far as Spain and Portugal, the empires they have, and then. English, Dutch, and French following. So there's a new economic strategy that they're going to be using, a new economic system, uh, and it's known as mercantilism. And it's contributed to by several people and ideas. Um, one of the people that kind of gets credit for it is this guy named uh, uh, Jean-Jacques Colbert. He's in France. He's the finance minister for Louis XIV, by the way, who we'll, we'll review later next week, I think. Um, and the whole system is going to be based on the idea that there's a limited amount of money or wealth in the uh, world. That uh, I get kind of nervous when subs cover economic concepts with the old Julia. But um, any idea what that it's called? What kind of wealth system it is? If there's one that they include as a fixed wealth. Yeah, there we go. Good. It's a fixed wealth system. So fixed wealth in capitalism, which is the system after this, we find out that you can actually create wealth. Uh, with labor um, and investing and loans and all, all, all sorts of tricks. But mm -hmm. at this point, they believe that the only way to get money is to literally get it yourself. Like, there's a certain amount of gold and silver and goods out there. Uh, and so when I accrue this wealth and this capital and this money, uh, that's all that there is. So the whole goal is for each country to do what, do you think, if there's a fixed amount of money out there? Control the wealth. Yeah, they want to control as much of that wealth as possible. All right, now, I mean, everybody wants to get rich, but they don't believe you can kind of create your own. They think you have to kind of steal it from other people, essentially. All right, so the whole goal of this is going to be to establish a system of uh, taxation. So the state's going to control a lot of these industries. Uh, and tariffs, which are a different type of taxation. Did Were you told what tariffs are? Yes. Taxes, taxes, on, taxes on, yeah, on imports, right? So imports are things coming into your country from somebody else. So like uh, if you're buying a Mercedes, that's a German car, that's not made here. It's made in Germany or somewhere else, and it's going to be brought here. That's an import, all right? But if we make stuff here like uh, furniture in the United States and we send that off to India, what would that be an example of? Export. Export. Good, yeah, we got that. All right, so the whole goal here is to establish tariffs. So your country is selling more things to other countries and buying less things from them. Why would they want to do that? Why would they want to sell more, like if I'm Britain? Why would I want to be selling more things than I'm buying from France? Why would I want to do that? What's the whole point of that one? Profit. Okay, profit. But 
link it to mercantilism because obviously you always want to trade things and sell things because that's profit. But like, why are they so concerned about not buying anything from anyone else and only selling things? So they don't give their wealth to somebody else. Right. So they think it's a fixed wealth system. If they're buying anything from other people, then that's uh, bad for them. They think they see it as a loss, right? So they want to. They want everything to be made and purchased inside of Britain or sold oh, outside of Britain. They do not want to buy anything from other people, essentially. So you guys understand that concept at least? Mm -hmm. All right, so how do these tariffs help them do that? Discourages people from buying stuff from uh, other places. Why? Or I should say how? Because they tax, they tax them, they don't want to get taxed. Okay, like what does it do though? I mean, if I'm gonna buy, you're not wrong, but I, I want a more, clear description of that so like whenever you buy like if you have two things that are one's from a different country one's from yours you uh -huh. can say, your home country is going to be much cheaper compared there to you that. go it's an incentive or in this case a disincentive so uh yes yeah, so you don't want to buy things because of the tax but the tax makes it more expensive so like uh you can use any example let's say it was uh cheese all right so they made cheese in britain and cheese in france uh, so they're what, what would normally be maybe i don't know ten dollars per Whatever, not percent. What a wheel of cheese? What do you even call cheese units? I don't even know. Uh, let's say a wheel of cheese uh, costs ten dollars just to make. All right. So then I've got my British one and my French one, or my English one and my French one. All right. So that's the same. So the English government doesn't like that, right? This is going to be a state-controlled um, economy, or at least mostly. That was uh, Colbert's big idea. Um, so what's the government going to do about this price uh, debacle here? Because you could, you could buy whichever one you wanted, because they're about the same price. What is the government going to do about that? How are they going to fix this cheese industry problem that they have? They just make the other one more expensive. How? Uh, taxes. Yep. What's that called again if it's on import? Uh, wait, what? Tariff? Yeah, a tariff, exactly. So they might put a massive tariff on French cheese. So let's say it's a $10 tariff per wheel. And uh, that now makes the French cheese, if you're going to buy it in England, $20. So which one am I going to buy if I'm a, a regular English person? The $10. You're going to buy the $10 one, right? Because it's, it's half the price, right? Now, if I'm more wealthy, you know, I could buy whatever. You know, it is how it is. But that's going to really discourage people from buying goods from other countries. Now, I, I made up the example about cheese, but you can apply it to any commodity uh, or, or any industry. And that's what they were trying to do. And every country was trying to do this. These are called tariff wars, by the way. Not that they're fighting each other, although they are, but not that they're fighting about these tariffs, but I mean, if, if I'm France and I know that England just put a tariff on my cheese so that they're, I'm gonna sell less cheese to England, what's France gonna do in return? Put a tariff on they're gonna put a tariff on English cheese, right? So that's what we call tariff wars. Uh, and that actually hurts everyone, by the way, uh, because now, you probably didn't get this example, but I'll explain it to you. If I'm a, uh, if I'm a peasant, and let's say, or a, I don't know, blacksmith, whatever I am. Let's say I only make $100 a month. All right, I'm gonna simplify it here. Obviously make more $100 a month, but let's say I make $100 a month. And if I wanna buy a month's worth of cheese, that used to be uh, $10. Okay, and I could, I could have my pick, right? And then I have another $90 to buy things like, I don't know, uh, bread, uh, coal or firewood. What else would they buy? Clothes. Actually, they probably make them, but whatever. These are all these things that they're going to be buying. Uh, and let's say they're all around $10, right? And I got choices between, you know, uh, English bread and Spanish bread and Portuguese bread and all these different choices, right? Um, but instead of all these things being as cheap as possible, some of them are not going to be accessible. So, for example, let's say for these clothes, clothes from England are $10, right? But uh, let's say I could buy clothes from, well, we'll just say France. France, and these ones are actually five bucks, they're cheaper, or India, or, or whatever. All right, France. So obviously, any regular person's gonna say, yeah, screw the $10 clothes, I'm gonna save my $100 here, or at least five of them, and buy the French clothes, right? So they were spending $15 on these two things. So if I'm gonna buy these two things in a month as a peasant, if I buy my clothes, and I buy my cheese, uh, I'm spending, if I buy the cheap ones, uh, 15 bucks, right? Okay. All right, that's nice. So we have a tariff on French cheese. All right, that doesn't change my prices, but now I can't buy the French cheese because now it's 20 bucks. And that's a lot of my money. That's like 10% of my money. So I can't even buy 
the French cheese now. But here's the big problem. What if the French clothes that were cheaper now get a tariff? And let's say they add $10 to this with a tariff, and that's $15 for French clothes. How does it impact uh, Mr. Peasant here, who makes $100 a month? It's more expensive. Why is that a problem for him or her? Okay. Right, so I've only got $100 a month, and now instead of spending $5 on clothes, I've got to spend twice as much. I have to spend $10 on clothes. So that's now a $20 expense for those two items. I just, I'm now spending substantially more money. So if I do this for all things, what's going to happen to all prices in England? They're all going to go up. So any cheap alternative coming from another country, I can't buy anymore. I've got to buy all of the more expensive stuff that's made here in Britain. All right, and that's actually going to harm uh, their economies uh, quite a bit. That's not even considering the fact that now France can't really sell a lot of stuff to them. Uh, so France loses money, so they put up tariffs. And now the, the British stuff that was selling to the French, they can't sell that, so they lose money that way. So they lose money twice. They lose money by having to spend more themselves, and they also lose money because they can't sell to other countries very well because the tariffs they put on them. All right, so it, it really harms everybody. Anyways, tariffs uh, and taxation uh, are going to be the core fundamentals here. And the whole goal, again, is to discourage people from buying stuff from other countries or states and buying it all within your own state. But I just showed you that's going to harm everybody. It's to make it more expensive to buy stuff in your state. And also, you're going to sell less because other states will buy less of your stuff. So it's, it's all bad for the most part. All right. So that's the fundamentals of mercantilism. We got that? All right, cool. So that's how they do it uh, with tariffs. That's one strategy for achieving wealth. The second one is to uh, literally, I guess we'd say, steal from uh, your, co your competitors. Competitors. And by that, I mean uh, states. So... If I'm a British ship and I'm sailing along in the Indian Ocean and I see a Portuguese ship sailing back, what's likely to happen under this mercantilist system? Yeah, they're going to they're gonna be fighting uh, to control, well, trade first of all, but if they see individual ships, they're just going to take the stuff that's on the ships, right? So this is going to cause a lot of conflicts uh, on these trade routes. So there's going to be two things going on here. Number one, they're going to, you're going to have piracy, right? And that, the Caribbean's a big target for that because it's so remote compared to the rest of Europe, and uh, the trade winds just kind of dump you off in the Caribbean Sea. So that makes it easy for pirates to just kind of wait for ships to keep coming through uh, to, uh, uh, to pirate from. All right, what is it called though when uh, I'm a government and I hire pirates to steal stuff for me? Privateers. Privateers, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if they gave you the example, but um, the example that uh, I give you is uh, Sir Francis Drake. Uh, he was an English pirate who was hired by the English crown, the, the, the king, the monarchy, to uh, pirate Spanish ships. So he just basically chilled. Oh, I don't have the Americas up here. He basically just chilled off the coast of uh, South America on the western coast all the way up here up until uh, uh, about San Francisco Bay region. And uh, he just absolutely devastated Spanish shipping. They couldn't catch him. And he got a ton, a ton, a ton of money. Uh, for uh, the English crown, so they united them actually. All right, the other way you can steal from your competitors is uh, you literally take their trade routes by force. All right, so the Dutch and the British do this to the Portuguese because what kind of an empire do the Portuguese have set up here initially? Trade, 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 trade posts, right. So all these, not all of them, but a lot of these little trade post empire cities that the Portuguese establish, uh, they can't defend all of them all the time. They can't communicate instantly. So over time, the British and the Dutch are just going to bully uh, the ships in them and take these cities and claim them as their own. So they're going to, of course, uh, how can I say this? Control trade networks. All right, and that's going to be by force, too. It's not like, a, oh, this is ours now. No, they, they actually fight for them uh, and take them. All right. Uh, and the third way mercantilism can make money is a concept known as colonialism. Did you guys cover that? No. No? Wait, yes, yeah. no, maybe so. Colonialism. That is simply this. It is the sending of Europeans, in this case, we're talking about European colonialism, the sending of Europeans across the world uh, to settle and take over the land and resources in that area. So at the time, we don't really have a lot of that going on over here because they can't, because in Africa you've got the tropical diseases. In Asia, you've got the large land empires that the Europeans don't have the money to go after yet, uh, being so far away. So they can't really do it there, 
But where could they establish colonies and take over land and claim the resources as their own and settle there? The Americas. Yeah, the Americas, and that's exactly what they do. So we have colonialism, which again, in this case, we're talking Europe. It's going to be the settling and controlling of uh, land and resources uh, abroad. Abroad just means outside of your own country, basically. Uh, in this case, it's going to be in the form of a maritime empire. Okay. Um, do you think that Europeans, after they claim the land, they're going to fight over who owns it? Yes. Oh, absolutely, right? So you're going to have colonial conflicts and wars uh, as well here. So there's going to be competition to claim and defend these colonies. Because if I own a colony and I hire or, or use uh, native workers or indentured servants or West African slaves, uh, that money is going to be really, those resources are going to make my country a lot of money, whether I'm Spain or Portugal or whoever. So they're going to fight over these. They'll set up forts, naval bases, they'll have entire wars over these uh, territories, uh, trying to get as many resources as possible for their own uh, state, their own mother country. So that's colonialism. So these are the three ways mercantilism is uh, going to make them money. You guys got that? Yeah. All right. So um, what encouraged initially, I think I talked about it yesterday in the study hall, what encouraged Spanish and Portuguese initially uh, to go out, risk their lives with almost nothing, and uh, try to conquer and settle these places? What was their incentive? Why, why would they want to do that? Encomiendas. Yeah, they, would, they were granting encomiendas for, for, for conquering, right? So initially, you've got some incentives to settle, uh, but it's not paid for, not paid for, at least not much, by the monarchies, because they don't have enough money to fund all these trips and pay for all these troops, so they depend on independent people to do it. Right, so the first way we talk about are those conquistadors. We talked about them yesterday, I won't go over them again. But that's just guys like Pizarro, Cortez. They go conquer an area, and their reward is they're the, now the feudal lords of that area, essentially. All right? That's a good incentive. A lot of people try, and a lot of people fail. The other way, though, this is the one that the English and the Dutch use a lot of, and the French, but mostly the English and the Dutch. These are called charter companies. And this one, I'm sure you guys were had explained to you, but, I mean, I don't know how well you understood it. It's, a, it's, a, it's an abstract concept. It's a difficult one. So, a charter company is a really good way to fund exploration and settlement. All right, so you're not going to be able to depend on kings and queens to pay for all this. Uh, and they can't. So I need private investors to do this. So any gentry or any nobility or anyone who has money that's willing to uh, pay for this. So before I get into the details of what a charter company is, they need to acquire funds. So you have two options back then. Number one, you could uh, have monarchs pay for it, right? Like Henry the Navigator, the, the Prince, or Fernand Isabella funding uh, Christopher Columbus. But that's not easy to do. Monarchs only have so much money. Uh, What's a way I could get multiple people to sort of contribute or invest into an exploration slash settlement expedition? Joint stock. Yeah, joint stock. So how does this joint stock funding work? Um, you would have um, a group of people pay a portion for the voyage and then they split it among everyone. Yeah, they do. Proportionally split it, or, or they're supposed to anyway. So. Let's say this uh, ship here represents the cost. Let's say it's like, I don't know, a million dollars. I'm making the numbers up, obviously. So if I have $100,000, that's 10% of that, uh, I would contribute that possibly to this, um, um, what am I talking about? Voyage, I invest it, so boom. There's my 10%, right? And then nine other guys or whatever invest for the rest of it. Yay, the ship goes off, it goes to the new world, and hooray, it comes back with a bunch of tobacco or, or, or sugar or gold or, or whatever. All right, so let's say that crew hauls in like uh, $10 million worth of goods after you pay them. So like you've already paid the crew and you're left with a profit of $10 million. What do you get? Million. You get the million, right? You get the 10% back. So you put in 10%, so whatever the profit is, you get back that 10%. All right, that's a great system. Uh, in fact, they even get smarter than this about it. So let's pretend I have a million dollars myself and I'm like, all right, I want to invest. What might be a bad idea, or a dangerous, or risky idea, about me paying for a voyage all by myself? 
What's my what's my what's the problem here with this the, the threat? Um, if you get nothing back, then you basically waste. Yeah, your money. a lot of these ships didn't come back. Either they were killed, or they were by, by natives, or other Europeans, or there was some sort of accident, or they just died of disease. All kinds of reasons these ships don't come back. Like, a lot of them didn't. It's not just like, oh, a few didn't. A lot of them did not. So if I sink all my money into one ship, and I send it off, what happens if it doesn't come back? Yeah, I basically just shipped off my money, right. So uh, that's going to be gone. So what could I do maybe to make sure that my odds of making money are much, much, much higher? Invest in uh, more than... Yeah, exactly. So instead of putting all my million into one ship, I might put a hundred thousand in ten ships. So are, is there a good chance that like four or five or six of those ships are gonna come back? Yeah. There is, right? There's a much more likely chance that people are gonna come back um, with profits, and the profits are usually much higher than what I invested. So even if half the ships don't come back, I'm okay because the returns are so good that I still make money off of the half that do come back. All right, so that's joint stock, and that's how people start investing with it. All right, so there's the funds, and there's my options. I can either joint stock it, or, you know, I could accept royal uh, support, what's called patronage. All right, so these charter companies are essentially, when they have the funds, they go and officially get permission, this is the charter, the contract, from the whatever country or state they're from. So whether it's England or the Netherlands, you would go to the government or the king, and you would have, your company would have a charter which is like a contract, which grants your company the authority to settle in the name of whatever your country is. So we'll just say England in this case. All right, so there's a charter for England. All right, so for like 10, 20, 30, 40 years, whatever the charter says, uh, you actually, as a company, are essentially going to be the government in that area. So like, you have to burden all the costs. Like if you need to pay for soldiers, you need to hire them yourselves. You need to pay for ships, you need to hire them yourselves. The crew, all that stuff, you have to fund. Uh, but you get all the benefits uh, for a while. So once you've established that colony and the contract runs out, then the uh, government takes over, right? The, the king actually uh, officially becomes part of the empire. Uh, you still get to keep your company there and operate there, but you don't, you don't own that. Uh, and that's what, the important thing to know about these charter companies are they work rather well, uh, well, relatively well, because they were privately funded, and uh, they would, of course, manage their own areas. So some were successful and some weren't, uh, but it was a good way to get people out there uh, and going uh, to do it. So here's a couple things that they could do. I don't know if you covered these or not. Did you, co did you cover what they could do specifically, like the powers they had? Yeah. Okay, good. So they could uh, raise their own uh, military, so whether it's Navy or soldiers, so Ray's own military force. That was legal for them, by the way. That's what made it kind of weird, too, by the way. They would fight over these trade networks with other companies. So I could be British and potentially fight other British ships. Uh, well, that was kind of rare, but certainly they would fight other countries' uh, charter companies. So for, here, here's an example. The Netherlands, the Dutch, and the uh, English were pretty friendly. So they pretty much never fought for the most part. They're always allies. But even if my countries are friendly, if I'm with a, an English charter company, like the British East India Company, and I'm sailing along, and I see a Dutch ship from the uh, Dutch East India Company, what's gonna happen? They're gonna fight. Yeah, they're gonna fight, exactly. They're gonna fight over the trade ports, they're gonna fight on the open seas, they're gonna fight for territory, even though their countries are actually you know, peaceful or even allies. Uh, because it's these companies are operating kind of on their own because of these uh, these charters. So they can raise an army. They can uh, uh, what's the word? Administer laws in the area, right? So they, they can't make up their own stuff for the most part. They have to use the mother country's laws. They they're like the government there uh, at least temporarily. They can also uh, sell and distribute the land as they want, just like a government can. And they can also negotiate with uh, local rulers. The company that does this the best, here's an example company, is the British East India Company. They actually are so successful, they are going to conquer and colonialize, colonize uh, all of India, what is now India, Pakistan, and um, uh, Bangladesh. So like entire civilizations are taken over by companies. 
So that's how efficient some of them can be at negotiating and using their funds to raise their own armies uh, and uh, encouraging people to come work for them. So over the course of about 100 years, the British East India Company starts in this tiny little sliver uh, and they're going to either by force or diplomatically uh, add these local territories in India until one day they're going to chase out the Mughal Empire and they're going to rule uh, this whole area uh, as a company, helped by the British, of course. But yeah, a company is going to essentially take over uh, those three modern-day countries and uh, administer them. All right, so do we understand what a charter company is? What is it? Yeah, exactly. It functions like a min miniature government for a, for a set amount of time, uh, and then they hand the territory over to the government, but they, they can still operate there. And uh, the profitability is quite high. Cool. So that's mercantilism. I think, is there anyone to talk about mercantilism? Tariff competition? Yeah. Got it. Cool. So let's do Tokugawa. Cross the Reformation, Russia, and the Qing Dynasty. So, some of these Europeans actually make the first <coughs> connections ever with Japan. Very, very far away. Oh, I should erase that. I don't know where it ends. I think that's where it ends. So, some of these initial Spanish and Portuguese uh, sailors, whether they go around the world or around Africa, they're going to uh, eventually connect with China, and last, they're going to connect with Japan. All right? So, what were the three motivations for exploration we talked about, or you talked about, anyway? God, glory, and... Gold. Gold, yeah. They wanted wealth. They wanted prestige, like these conquistadors wanted to get themselves their own feudal kingdoms. And uh, they also wanted to spread Christianity. So, in the 15 and 1600s, we have a lot of Spanish and Portuguese missionaries. Do you guys remember what a missionary is? What are they? Yeah, that's their, that's their mission, is to just spread Christianity or Islam or whatever religion that they uh, believe. So these are Christian missionaries. So they're Catholic, obviously they're Portuguese and Spanish, and they get into uh, Japan, and they're going to really aggressively try to convert a bunch of Japanese. And they actually get quite a few, especially in South Japan. There's one of the European power that gets there, and they don't do anything religious. They're just like, whatever, we just want to trade with you guys. Those are the Dutch. And these guys are the ones that don't get in trouble, and these guys are the ones that get in trouble. So they arrive in Japan, and they start their missionary work in the uh, late 1500s and early 1600s. All right, so they're there. All right, so we know the missionaries there now, mm -hmm. and they're converting people, but not the Dutch. The Dutch are pretty much just there economically. All right, so in 1600, we have a brand new, for the first time, unified, centralized Japan. This, as far as I know, hasn't happened, at least stayed, at least hasn't stayed stable, uh, a unified central government in Japan. So, who was the, uh, who were the, highest part of the feudal hierarchy in Japan? Shogunate. The shoguns. They were the shoguns. Those are the individuals, yes. So we had one family, one clan, called the Tokugawa clan. They were, uh, of course, led by a shogun. And that shogun, uh, through diplomacy and forming allies as well as conquest, he's going to, and they're going to, for the first time, conquer all regions of Japan and unify them under one centralized government. All right, and that centralized government is going to be known as the Tokugawa Shogunate. And the reason why it's called that is there's still an emperor, but the emperor is only, what's the word I'm looking for? Not cosmetic, but figurative, thank you. He's only figurative uh, uh, leader. He doesn't actually have authority. The real authority is actually with the Shogun. Um, if you guys ever watched that, Bill Wirtz, uh, world history in 10 minutes or whatever. Super good, by the way. He does a thing on Oh, no, he does the history of Japan. Yeah. Uh, if you watch the history of Japan, he talks about that uh, whole uh, debacle that they have. Anyways, so there is an emperor, but he doesn't actually have power. He's just a figurative head. The actual leader is the uh, shogun at the head of the Tokugawa clan. All right, so he moves the capital from Kyoto. Remember, they tried establishing that as the, the uh, capital with the Taika reforms uh, a while back. Um, he moves the capital to Edo. 
which is along the coast of, of the uh, Pacific, so Edo. Some people actually call this era that the Tokugawa shogunate was in charge, uh, the uh, Edo period. Uh, and that's going to last all the way until 1868, I believe, when they're overthrown. Uh, so, Tokugawa. They are going to be shoguns that rule from Edo. That's the new central government. Uh, and things are going to actually do quite well under the Tokugawa. They're going to have um, more peace because there's not a bunch of little feudal kingdoms fighting each other all the time. So they're under a centralized government. There's more peace and prosperity. They're able to do things like uh, focus more on education, uh, fighting against you know, famine, things like that. So things are looking up. But there's one development that's going to start... Uh, it's, it's going to harm them in the long run. So something happens that doesn't happen much uh, under centralized Japan. Uh, there's going to be a rebellion. Do you know what the name of that rebellion is? Shimabara. Yeah, Shimabara Rebellion. All right, that's in the, the 1630s. I think it's 1637, actually. 1637, you have the Shimabara Rebellion. Now, these are uh, peasants who are opposing the taxes and policies uh, of this uh, shogunate. Now, again... Once Japan is centralized, obviously feudal Japan fought a bunch just like feudal Europe does. But once the shogun, the Tokugawa shogun had unified it, we're going to have very little actual violence and fighting and crime. Like it, it, It's all going to drop. All right, so this is one of the few instances of a major opposition to the government. All right, so these uh, peasants are, of course, going to be motivated by fight, fighting against taxation and tax policies. But there's one other thing that characterizes these people that the uh, uh, shogunate really focuses in on. They're Catholic. Yeah, most of them have been converted by Spanish and Portuguese missionaries uh, to Catholicism. So uh, a majority of uh, rebels were Catholic. Now the Tokugawa shogunate crushed this um, rebellion, uh, but they're going to change their policy and attitude towards foreigners. Uh, they're going to blame this... Um, event on the fact that uh, these foreign ideas uh, from these from the Europeans Christianity have <clears throat> were the root cause of this uh, rebellion essentially so they're going to ban Christianity but even more than that what else are they going to ban any interaction with foreigners yeah, exactly so if I'm a Japanese person and I leave and come back I'm subject to punishment or death and if I'm a foreigner and I show up even if you don't know uh, and, you're, and you're caught, uh, you are subject to punishment and death as well. In fact, it was just death. So, starting um, after the Shimabara Rebellion, uh, I think by 1639 was finalized, we have a, an era, 39, known as uh, Sokoku. And that's going to last all the way until 1853, when the United States ends their isolation by force. So, for uh, about 200 years, the Japanese are closed off to pretty much everybody except for one group uh, who stuck strictly to trade and didn't um, really try to interfere with them uh, in their culture. China? Uh, no, it's like the Dutch, although they do trade a little bit with the, China, the Chinese still. But the uh, Dutch are the major trade partners that they're going to allow in it. Like two or three ports, they can come in as long as they don't uh, do any missionary work. And the Dutch were cool with that. They're just like, whatever, we'll take some money. So, Sokoku is this uh, Japanese isolation uh, era. And the Japanese, unfortunately, chose one of the worst times to isolate themselves from the world because this is right at the same time, roughly, when the Europeans are going to make all kinds of innovations and discoveries. So Japan, in two centuries, is going to fall incredibly far behind uh, the West in Europe because they're going to have the scientific revolution and develop all kinds of crazy new technologies and ideas. And uh, the Japanese are still going to be sitting on Japan with their samurai swords, essentially. Uh, so that years later... When the U.S. shows up and says, hey, we want to trade with you because uh, we want your money, and the Japanese want to say no, they can't because they don't have any of the gunpowder weapons that they would need to uh, to stop the United States. So that's going to be a uh, major event in Japanese and world history, and it's going to lead to uh, World War II, which will, at least in Asia, which we'll talk about later in the year. So any questions about the Tokugawa <coughs> Shogunate? So no things about them. Unified Japan and central government. Peace and prosperity, but after the Shimabara Rebellion, which they blamed on Christianity, they're going to shut themselves off from foreigners and foreign ideas, uh, and they chose the wrong time to do it, because uh, the rest of the world is going to be advancing, especially in Europe, quite quickly. All right, we got that? All right, cool. Let's do um, 
Russia and the Qing Dynasty, and maybe the Protestant Reformation. Russia, super quick. In fact, I'll, I'll kind of have you guys tell us to me if you can. So, what was the empire out of Central Asia that controlled this region in the uh, 1300s? The yeah, the Mongols, the Golden Horde. However, by the 1400s or so, or the 13 or 1400s, the uh, Golden Horde is going to weaken, and these Slavic peoples are going to uh, chase them back out. So, Golden Horde's going to be out, and temporarily, we have the people of uh, that were the Kievan Rus. So we have Kiev, Novgorod, and Moscovy are the three major areas or territories that emerge or reemerge. All right, so I've got Kiev, I've got Novgorod, and I've got Moscovy. So who is going to, in the 1500s, uh, conquer the rest and incorporate them into a, what is the first Russian state or, or like a Russian empire? What? Oh, Muscovy, yeah, but what, what leader? You're right, it's going to be Muscovy that does it, which capital is Moscow. Uh, but who's the person that does that? Ivan the Third. Yeah, Ivan the Third, who is later known as Ivan the Great. Ivan the Third is Ivan the Great uh, in the 16th century. I don't know the exact years, I think it's the 1520s, but don't quote me. Uh, he's going to conquer Novgorod, take almost all of their territory, and eventually uh, take parts of Kiev. That actually falls later, but he does unite what type of people? He was... Not all Slavic people. There's many other Slavs. What type of Slav do they unite for the most part? Almost all of them. The Rus? The Rus people, the Russians, yes. Uh, so he crowns himself Tsar or Emperor of the Rus. And this is what we have as the first uh, Russian state. And Russia's only going to expand from this point on uh, for the most part. All right, cool. So that was good. And look, he, he got the name Ivan the Great because he did so well. Uh, how about his son? Oh. Terrible. 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 Ivan Terrible, yeah. Ivan the uh, Fourth or the Terrible. Not as awesome. All right. So what were these uh, nobles that had a lot of independence and power in this area before uh, it was sort of taken over and centralized by, or at least started to be centralized by the, um, uh, the, the czars? Boyar. Yeah, so I had a lot of Russian uh, nobles, known as boyars, who had a lot of independence and political power. However, Ivan IV's goal was to uh, increase his personal power and centralize the Russian state, or at least start it anyway. So, one of the things he did was he uh, stripped these guys of their land uh, and titles, at least in, in half of the territory that was his. Um, and how are they going to feel about that one? Yeah, so what are they going to do about it? They're just going to sit back and be like, oh, that sucks. No, they're going to they're gonna try to muster up some resistance to this. So, unfortunately for them, they're dealing with a, uh, uh, a paranoid psychopath in Ivan IV. And these boyars, who are going to try to resist his uh, land reforms, because they, like I said, they lost a lot of their land when it was, became his private stuff. Uh, so they're going to resist, but unfortunately for them, they're going to be uh, crushed, not only militaristically, but he's actually going to send a what's kind of like a secret police force out to apprehend uh, and, and kind of destroy this entire class, at least in his area. Uh, what was the name of that phase or that, that sort of secret police force that did that? Uh, yeah, Operchina, if we're even saying that right. Uh, and the, uh, I guess you would say, miniature era or time in which they were terrorizing people was known as the Operchina Terror. So those are the secret police. And that's how he got his nickname, by the way, because he would uh, confiscate them, take their land, and then torture and kill them, essentially. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Uh, enough to really terrify everybody, uh, especially the people uh, in, in Novgorod. Uh, he would go after them particularly, with particular tenacity. So the Operchina Terror. All right, so that's the darker, I can't even say dark history of Russia, because Russia's history is almost entirely dark. But um, we have a more of a bright spot in the late 1600s and early 1700s uh, with a new ruler who's going to expand, make some reforms that are a little dark and sinister at some points, but um, they're overall they're going to be beneficial. Peter the Great. Yeah, Peter the Great. And he was a fanboy of who? Louis XIV. Louis XIV. Yeah, he really liked the way that he did things. He's going to copy him almost down the board. I just want the year for, I think it's 1786, but I don't know if I'll write the wrong one. Or sorry, 1686. 
What is it exactly? It's A2. There we go. 1682 to 17. I'm 25. 25. Thank you. All right. Uh, so some reforms he's going to make. He's going to try to, what's the word lucky for? Centralize. But he's going to enhance the power of the monarch. He's going to enhance monarch power, just like Louis did. And he's also going to try to um, westernize them. So he's going to try to copy some of the tactics Western Europeans are using. So what does he try to do with the economy in Russia? Tries to make a maritime... Exactly. He tries to form a maritime empire with colonies and trade. It's too late for that, though, because pretty much Europe's claimed all the land that can be claimed at that time before they have you know, technology to go into the, the rainforests and take over other empires. So uh, where does he try to build this new city to make this you know, new trade city and capital? St. Petersburg. Yeah, so he builds St. Petersburg on a swamp. Literally. Lots of people had dying constructing that bad boy. St. Petersburg, he attempts to become a maritime empire, or make Russia a maritime empire. All right. And um, he wants to be, that's for trade. But uh, they can't, because like I said, it's pretty much all claimed, or at least the territory that can be claimed at the time, by uh, either Spain or Portugal, England, uh, uh, Netherlands, or France. So what does Russia have to resort to as far as expansion? Because they can't really do it uh, over, over the seas. How do they do it? Into the yeah, exactly. So they're going to expand into um, Asia, into Central and East Asia. Nice. Okay. Um, did she tell you what they did with the uh, what he did with the nobles? Um, they gave them power in the government. Yeah. So he kind of went along the lines. Lou, Lou did a better job of it, but. He basically forced them all to move around him and use them in the military and government, kind of like Louis did. So I would say he controlled the nobility. Excellent. Uh, there was one problem, though. It's really expensive to build an entire city. Oh, and his palace, too, which was he was trying to copy Versailles. What was the name of his palace? Winter Palace. Yeah, Winter Palace. All this is very expensive, requires a lot of labor. So if a government's going to buy something like this and pay for it, who, where's the money coming from? Peasants. Yeah, the peasants. They, they increase what to get it? Uh, taxes. taxes. So a lot of these peasants don't like the overcrowding and the overtaxation. So what do these peasants end up doing? Moving. Yeah, moving. Okay, cool. So we had uh, the Empire of Russia beginning, and they're going to expand even without Peter, but with Peter they're going to expand even more. So they get into Central Asia, they get into uh, East Asia, and of course these peasants are going to say, well, screw this area with all of its taxes, and it's overcrowding, and they're going to start uh, settling these Russian peasants on the frontier in Central Asia uh, by the military forts and, and things like that. Okay, cool. So that's Russia, and that's how we, uh, that's at least Russia during period two. All right, China during period two. We start with which dynasty? Ming. Ming, nice. They're the ones that kick out the Mongols in 1368. I'm not sure that's the exact year. 1644. Uh, they do rather well. Initially, they, they continue the maritime trading and the uh, 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 tribute system, and they even send a large naval force and trading force around the Indian Ocean all the way into Africa, led by uh, Zheng Ha. Admiral Zheng Ha, yeah. So there's a lot of uh, maritime trade and voyages at the beginning, and Zheng Ha's expedition is an example one. Comes back with a lot of uh, a lot of exotic goods. Uh, he gets all the way, as far as I know, uh, to the uh, Swahili coast, and then he goes back. Um, but the Ming's going to focus on something else. What are they worried about happening again? The Mongols conquering. Yeah, or, or just pastoralists in general. Even if even if the Mongols can't organize themselves, they're worried about this northern frontier. So here's the Ming. They're worried about this northern frontier uh, where they've had a lot of troubles with pastoral tribes before Mongols, Zhongyu, etc. So they focus a lot on uh, bolstering their defenses up here with soldiers and walls and fortresses. And uh, where do they take that money uh, from? I know, that, I know they raise taxes and they have the silver only tax, but like, what do they, instead of using, oh. so they use government money for this instead of what? What do they, what do they neglect uh, and, and go away from? All of the um, Indian Ocean trade. Yes, exactly. So they basically let their uh, navy rot uh, into nothingness and they de-emphasize trade and they focus on, on northern defense and they neglect maritime trade. 
All right, how does that work out for him? Badly. Yeah, and they had the whole silver tax debacle or silver tax policy debacle. Their economy uh, takes a hit. Uh, they're uh, not going to be making money off of building defenses. That's just going to protect them, uh, so they don't have income as much income coming in for trade. And at least they're vulnerable to invaders from where? Uh, Manch yeah, modern day Manchuria, which is also the north. So good thing about those defenses that they just rode around. And uh, these Manchu invaders, the dynasty they begin in 1644 is known as what? Qing. Qing, yeah. So these are uh, Manchurian or Manchu invaders, different ethnic group. All right, so they take over, and they're actually going to expand uh, the, uh, the Qing dynasty, the Chinese, by quite a bit. They're going to expand the south a little bit. They're finally going to conquer this Himalayan empire that's always giving them trouble. Tibet. Tibet, yeah. They're going to get back into Central Asia, uh, and they, of course, incorporate their own area of uh, Manchuria. And China is going to become as big, the biggest it will ever, it has ever been. All right, so they're going to uh, add a lot of territory. A lot of territory. And um, that includes Tibet. That's always giving them trouble. And who was one example of a great emperor uh, who lived a long time and helped expand China's borders quite a bit under the Tang? Yeah, Emperor Kangxi. Kangxi. Uh, what else did he do that um, demonstrated his power and authority? Uh, portraits. What kind of portraits? Mini portraits? Um, life-size life -size portraits, right. That, that's like a theme back then. His monarchs tried to show how powerful they were by paying for these ridiculous uh, projects or uh, art pieces. So. In the Ottoman Empire, we have those miniature paintings. In uh, China here, we have life-size portraits. In, uh, what, what did like Peter the Great and uh, Louis XIV do? Palaces. Palaces, right. So they would dump all this money this to, to sh demonstrate their power. Life-size portraits. Okay. Uh, and the Qing are do very well up until mm, period three in, in world history. Uh, and they're going to suffer at the hands of the Europeans and their new technologies and imperial power. But, how badly are these Manchu people outnumbered by the Han Chinese, which again are this ethnic group here? Yeah, about 10 to 1. So they're going to have to be uh, pretty strict to keep control of them. And the Han are the native Chinese there. Uh, but there's a couple things they like about the uh, Han civilization in China. It's, it's lasted a long time, probably a lot longer than, consistently longer than any other civilization. Uh, in the world, what are the, uh, what's one of the things that they end up keeping? Neo-Confucianism. Yeah, why do they like Neo-Confucianism so much? Yeah, it really had a good model, an East Asian model anyway, for maintaining social harmony. Uh, so there's a lot less rebellions, uh, and there's a lot more stability than in most places in the world, which is one of the reasons why China's lasted so long. All right, cool. But of course, Neo-Confucianism Confucianism is rather oppressive uh, as far as, uh, or regarding women anyway. So they like Neo-Confucianism, what else do they keep? Confucian yeah, so that examination system. Confucian examination system. Uh, and what what is this examination system? What, what's it for and what, why would I do it? Basically to get into the government. Uh-huh. So you would have to study Basically, your whole life, and then you take the test. Or for many years, anyway, yeah. yeah. And then you take the test, if you pass it, you get a spy in the government. Yep, at least you're eligible to, exactly. So, uh, but why, but there's tons of people, I have a government job right now, like, technically. Like, why do, why do we not care about government jobs as much here, but they care about them so much, uh, at least in China, at the time? The hierarchy. What about it? Um, the governors are the top spot. Yeah, the government officials had the most power and wealth, for the most part in China at the time. Because remember, they didn't value merchants over there. Europeans value independently wealthy merchant class people, right? Um, in East Asia, especially in China, they don't value them. They see them as people making money off of others. They value people that maintain uh, power and authority and harmony. So that's like the pinnacle of Chinese society is to get into the government. So that's why people dedicated the majority of their at least young lives to do it. All right, so that's the stuff they kept. What are the policies they implement, though, that are kind of oppressive? In fact, one is, it's just straight oppressive. In an attempt to kind of control and prevent their race from being sort of bred out. Um, they ban intermarriage. 
Between whom? Um, between the Han and Manchu people. Exactly. Between Han and Manchu. And like I told you earlier, uh, even though it's not illegal as far as I know, um, in China currently, they still don't condone marriage between the two ethnic groups. It's one of those things like, uh, it'd be like if it was like 1830 and you're in the South and you're like a white person and a black person that got married, like your families would probably disown you. Uh, and that's sort of the situation that uh, some families in China experience. Like I told you about my college professor who had that exact scenario. Her family disowned her because she married a Manchu person. She's Han Chinese. So that sort of racism continues today over there. All right, what else did they do that was uh, oppressive as a means to control and subjugate the uh, Han people? Um, they have the Q, which is for the male on their side. Yep, where they shaved the front of it, and you had to have the, the, the braided ponytail thing in the back. Uh, and they were required, uh, punishable by uh, uh, imprisonment and or death, uh, depending on the severity. So they, uh, of course, require Q hairstyle Oops. for all men. Cool. All right, so I will cover the process of reformation when we do the scientific revolution next week. Adios. All right, so... Cross Reformation and Scientific Revolution. So, Cross Reformation. All right, so why do I have a bunch of old uh, Christian texts like from St. Augustine and some of the scriptures, as long as uh, the other uh, classical knowledge? Uh, information being brought back from the Holy Land with the Crusades. Yeah, there we go. So we got coming back from the Crusades. All right, so info uh, from Crusades. Let me talk about this in the Renaissance. It's the same stuff. Uh, what are their trade network... Um, brought some stuff in uh, between the, well, around the 12 and 1300s. Uh, yep, Silk Road before it gets shut down again. And then, of course, uh, Venice uh, and other traders uh, with the Arab Caliphates as well in the Mediterranean, the trade in Mediterranean. All right, cool. So that information comes back. We get skepticism again. We get a lot of old secular thinking. That was the Renaissance stuff. Uh, but regarding religion, we're going to have, uh, like I said, some of those classical Christian texts like St. Augustine, one of the early Christian writers, and the uh, uh, Gospel from uh, the Disciples. So we've got uh, Gospel, Scripture, St. Augustine writings are all coming back. All right, but before I talk about how that's impacting things over there, or in Europe, um, how, how were things set up in Europe just before and as these are coming in? And what I mean by that is, who's got access to the scripture uh, or the Bible, and um, how? Okay, how? Nice. Catholic Church is going to be the ones that control the information, essentially. Uh, info regarding Christianity. And uh, let's not forget that they don't have it in every language. They only have it in, uh, depending on where you are, uh, Greek or Hebrew or Latin, mostly Latin, um, as far as like their documentation goes. Uh, so they've got their own documentation they make, they've got some of the old texts uh, in their original languages, and uh, who, who has the, who's the authority in, under the Catholic system, who's their authority regarding uh, like how to go to heaven, how to be a Christian, and all of those things? Yeah, so the church itself. So would you say it's the documents or the organization? organization? The organization, yeah. Okay, cool. So they are considered the authority of spiritual life. That means, I heard the whisper, that means they're the ones that determine what you're supposed to do to go to heaven and uh, the details as far as uh, how to get there or get out of purgatory and not go to hell and uh, how you should confess and how often and all of the uh, festivals and holidays you should realize and when you should and shouldn't eat fish, all that stuff, they're the ones that are going to determine that. Uh, because again, as many people are going to find out, almost none of that stuff is actually in these uh, documents. All right, It's mostly uh, created by the Catholic Church across you know, centuries, different councils and popes, etc. All right, so they're the authority of spiritual life. And they have some, uh, some corrupt practices are in place. Uh, and they're actually, it's not like they're doing them, you know, behind closed doors. Like, they're doing them out in the open. Like, some of these are official policies. So, what are three examples? 
Well, there are three examples. Tell me, give me one and explain it as well, uh, that some of these reformers like Luther are going to start complaining about. So just one and explain it. Indulgences where you buy on your way into heaven. Oh, yeah, or out of purgatory quicker. Yeah, there you go. Indulgences. So that's kind of like selling salvation. All right. Uh, I don't have a second. I think it was you. Nepotism. Nepotism, which is? They give church positions to the family members. Yeah, instead of uh, making it based on merit or who should have earned it based on the time committed, etc., they're giving it off to uh, family members. All right, that's uh, clearly a corrupt practice. Simony, uh, selling offices. Yeah, also, probably even more corrupt uh, is simony, or at least as corrupt. That's where they're just selling the offices to the highest bidder instead of basing it on their spirituality or uh, history in the church or experience or anything like that. All right, so definitely we're going to have some people complaining about that. Unfortunately for those that complained before the 15th century, it was not easy to get their ideas out. Can we think of an example of somebody that may have protested um, and then uh, ended up paying the ultimate price for that? Jan Hus. Jan Hus from the uh, Czech Republic of Bohemia, uh, what's now the Czech Republic. Uh, Jan Hus tried this in the 1300s, but there was no way to disseminate the information. There's another guy named John Wycliffe in England. He's pretty far away from the Catholic Church uh, as far as the Pope goes. He was able to not be pursued. Uh, but Jan Hus uh, got, the, uh, got the stake, burned at the stake, as far as I know. I think he's burned at the stake. Regardless, he was killed. All right. Um, so, as a heretic. What's going to change this, though? What's going to allow later critics of the church to distribute their information before the church can, like, silence them uh, and allow their <coughs> ideas to spread and become popular? Yeah, the printing press is going to really change the dynamic here. All right, cool. So there's a particularly... There's a particular monk who has gotten access to some of these original documents. Uh, he's reading them, and he realizes some of the inconsistencies. His name's Martin Luther. You guys all know that. Got like 30 hands up. Uh, so Martin Luther, he's going to write a document and nail it on the uh, door of the Wittenberg Castle in church. And uh, I want to know what the name of this document is, and what is it exactly? Oh, half the hands went down. <laughs> You're looking, but I would accept it. 95 pieces is like 95 reasons why. Like yeah, that's kind of like 95 problems he has with uh, the uh, Catholic Church at the time. All right, he probably could come up more, but he did the 95. So Luther, in uh, 1570, is kind of like the unofficial or, or even official beginning of the Protestant Reformation. He's going to have his 95 theses. Okay, and so what are some of his criticisms then of uh, Martin Luther? He's a monk, again, a German monk. Uh, I think he was from Saxony, don't quote me, but uh, German monk. And he's going to, somebody fell, I guess, in the other room. Uh, he's going to be a German monk, and he's going to protest the Catholic Church. What I want to know is, what are some of the problems he had with this Catholic Church? <clears throat> How so? Um, it, uh, what's it called? The, the world is a, an organization that the Pope would make everything. Yes, so he was upset that so many of the original writings were being uh, either ignored or not written over, but being added to. And he didn't feel like they were in line with the uh, fundamental values that are being presented in the early scriptures, which is you know, more about like forgiveness and mercy and missionary work, etc. The church had really turned away from that in, in the medieval, in the Middle Ages. Um, and uh, he, he pointed out some of the most, I guess, poignant examples uh, where they're really diverging from fundamental Christian theology or belief. All right, cool. So he writes this. Um, and he's going to go to uh, debate them, the Catholic Church, where they eventually plan to kill him. But his buddy, Fre Frederick the Elector, uh, tips him off and they get out of there. Uh, what was this meeting? Where was it at? The Diet of Worms. Yeah, Diet of Worms, absolutely. So he has a debate. Uh, he kind of stumps him on a few things. And then he gets out of there uh, after the advice from his friend, uh, Frederick the Elector. And uh, they're going to uh, send him off and protect him. So. What's going to happen? 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 What's going to happen is um, we'll talk more about this when we get to AP Euro. But the Catholic Church is going to have a separate meeting by themselves. That's called the Council of Trent. Um, I, I don't, you don't have to write that down, but I just want to set the context a little bit. So the Catholics don't just ignore this. It's like, oh, we got away. I guess that's it. No, they're like they basically said, well, his ideas are spread now, so we should at least talk about them and see if he's right. So they had this meeting, it was, and I'm not joking, it was a 20 year meeting. It wasn't like one single sitting obviously, but they talked about this stuff off and on, you know, in the summer and spring when they'd meet. 
um, for almost 20 years, this Council of Trent. And uh, well, they uh, really talked about genuinely, is this guy right? Are some of these things uh, incorrect? Are we you know, diverging from traditional Christianity? Uh, are we in the wrong? And uh, after 20 years of debate and discussion, they decided that uh, no, they were not wrong. They were right across the board. I'm not joking, that's actually what happened. They uh, rejected all Protestant claims and they are going to, the resolve is to be, uh, is to oppose and eliminate Protestants as heretics. All right, so this kind of sets off this era of religious war uh, that we're talking about, starting in like the mid 16th century. Uh, we'll get more into that when we get to AP Euro. Uh, but one of the examples of a large scale religious war, at least one that started out that way, was, uh, well, it sounds like you guys know, all the hands up. The 30 years. Yeah, 30 years war. Okay, well, I'm, I'm actually getting a little ahead there. I just want to tell you that side story that helps kind of make sense about the um, Catholic Church's position regarding Protestants. So they actually talked about it for a while, and then they're like, nope, we're right. So Luther's main problem, well, he had many problems with the Catholic Church, but one of the main ones was he felt that the Catholics had made a bunch of stuff up. That's what he believed, and his followers also believed that. And there was a lot of them. His followers were predominantly in northern and western Germany. Uh, he had a lot also in the Scandinavian region when it got there. Uh, the Netherlands also liked uh, Protestant ideology. Not from Luther, from a guy named Calvin, but very close. Uh, some people in France also, and uh, the English and Scottish later are all going to really like at least the idea of Protestantism. Uh, they're at least going to reject the Catholic Church. So, again, the Catholic Church, they believe that the people that, or the entity that determines how you get to heaven is, again, remind me, what do they believe is the one that does that? The church themselves, right? They think the Catholic Church, through the Pope and the Cardinals, they can make changes uh, to Christian theology, all right? Kind of like a caliph can, like we talked about with the uh, uh, Muslim caliphates. So his problem is the church believes that the authority is, of course, going to be them. Catholics, the Catholics. They believe that the authority is the uh, church itself. They can make and change things at will. They believe that the Pope is like the messenger or Jesus incarnate on, on I don't remember exactly their, their particular view on it, but he is somehow either linked to communicate or know or be uh, the representative of God on earth. Some, something along those lines. I'm not Catholic, so I'm not exactly sure, but he has some sort of divine connection uh, or representation. All right, so they can make those changes. Uh, who does Luther, though, the original Protestant, believe is, or what, is the uh, authority regarding how they should be or act as Christians. Scripture. Yeah, he believes that it's scripture alone as authority. Meaning, in fact, actually, somebody tell me what the hell that means. What the heck that means. Basically, you only need faith in your inter interpretation of the scriptures. In order to do. Yeah, exactly. So if, if I want to know what to do, I'm supposed to read the Bible and the scriptures, uh, St. Augustine, etc., and I'm supposed to gather my own meaning from that. And the only thing I really need to go to heaven is, is faith in, um, in, 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 in Jesus or the Trinity or, or however he phrases it. But it's really just faith. You don't need to do a bunch of like works like not eat fish on this day and go to this festival and have this holiday and pray this many times and confess to this priest. He says none of that's required. You just got to have faith and, and try to be a Christian and base your life on how you think the scripture is laid out. All right. So I had a question yesterday about like, what is Lutheranism then? Because this is Protestantism. All right, so Protestantism rejects the Catholic Church's authority, and they believe, I should actually be Protestants, they think that Scripture is authority. So what we're going to find out happens immediately is this is not going to be a, a unified group. All right, so just tell me, what do you think might happen if you give millions of people Scripture and you say, read it yourself and see what it means? Are they all going to interpret it the same? No. no. So immediately... We're going to have this Protestant movement fragments very quickly. So you've got a bunch of followers that believe what Luther believes, but you also have people that believe other things. Uh, you have uh, Calvinists who follow John Calvin's views. Uh, you have Zwinglians who believe what uh, uh, Ulrich Zwingli believes. And there's all kinds of people that come up with new ideas. Uh, and some of them are going to be persecuted. Like, uh, I know one of the radical controversial views back then was you shouldn't baptize children. You should wait till they're adults and they can choose it. And people did not like that idea back then. Uh, they were called Anabaptists, and they were they were heavily persecuted across Europe. Um, but regardless, what I want you to know is 
if you think that you're supposed to interpret the Bible to get your meaning, people are going to have lots of different interpretations of that exact same um, uh, text. So very quickly, we don't have one single Protestant movement. We have a bunch of different denominations. And if you know anything about Protestantism, if you look at the list of denominations, it's like practically the length of the Bible, just the list of the names of them, like Baptists and Methodists and I'm running out of names here already. Quakers and Lutherans and uh, Evangelicals and uh, all, all, it just goes. It's a huge list. So uh, that's what's going to happen with the Protestant. It's going to frag. But they do have to unify because, again, <coughs> Spain and other Catholic states are coming after them pretty quickly. Uh, after the Council of Trent, they decide we've got to reunify Europe and get rid of these heretics. Uh, so that's going to lead to all of these religious wars that we'll talk a lot more about in AP Euro. But you do know one of them. Thirty Years' War is an example of them. What else do I want to say about this? Oh, what it does with language. So how does this whole printing press thing help develop language? There we go. Okay, cool. So he kind of standardizes German, much like Shakespeare helps to do in English and Cervantes helps to do in Spanish. Um, Luther is going to help, uh, he's just going to really, uh, develop a common way of speaking in German grammatically. Uh, he's going to develop vernacular German. And how does he do that? It involves the printing press, obviously, but what's he going to, what, what, I already kind of said it. How, how did people read the Bible before? Or any documentation? They, they, they pretty much couldn't. It was limited to the clergy. Like I said, in some cases, they literally had one Bible or, or, or set of documents chained to the church itself, so you couldn't take it. It was often in a language like Latin or Greek or Hebrew, so you couldn't read it anyway. But Luther says, screw that, and he goes through, I don't even know how long it took him, and he translated the entire entirety of the Bible and the scriptures from uh, its various source uh, languages into German, uh, which takes a long time, and then uses the printing press to mass distribute that. So that does two things. Number one, again, it gives you kind of a, a standard form of German that everyone begins to recognize and use. Uh, but also, now everybody knows his ideas. So this Protestantism thing spreads like wildfire uh, throughout Europe. So yes, it helped to develop vernacular German when he uh, wrote a German, wrote the Bible, translated it into the uh, German language, and then spread it out. And of course, everybody else can follow suit too. English does it, then French does it, and then now it's in, I don't even know how many languages, probably like Probably, how many languages are there? I think there's several thousand. So I'm sure, I'm sure it's up there, <clears throat> whatever it actually is. All right, that's pretty much what we need to know about the Protestant Reformation in this class. So it's gonna cause a major split in Europe. Um, it's gonna be driven largely by this printing press and the efforts of Luther and the translations uh, that he does. It's gonna develop German, and it's going to start a lot of religious conflicts that are gonna devastate Europe for a long time. All right, all the way to 1648 when France decides, ah, let's not do about religion anymore. Let's just focus on expanding our state. All right. Any questions about that? All right. This is why it's connected to the scientific revolution. You're like, why is this connected to the scientific revolution? This is why. All right. Catholics are very, very, very controlling. At least they were. They're not anymore. In the Middle Ages, they were very controlling uh, when it came to information. So if you ever said anything that went against what they said was official, uh, you were considered a heretic, and you, you could be burned at the stake or killed for it. Uh, and you're like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're like saying stuff about Satan or whatever, yeah, okay. They're not saying stuff about Satan, though, or saying don't be Christian. They're just saying things like, the earth might be round, or we might not be the center of the universe. We might be orbiting around the sun, actually. That kind of stuff could potentially get you killed. Why would they want to kill you? That sounds a little ridiculous. Just pointing out that we might re revolve around the sun. Why, why would that be wrong? Uh, what belief? Yeah, exactly. It's breaking away from what the church thinks as the official doctrine laid out by them and God, right? So it, it, it's like you're disagreeing with God to them, all right? And to them, that's, a, that's punishable. And maybe not necessarily by death, but certainly punishable, uh, a punishable offense. So that's going to be very limiting throughout the Middle Ages. This is one of the reasons, along with guilds, that controlled wages and techniques and things like that. The guilds and uh, the Catholic Church and instability are going to be three major fa factors that basically keep 
Europe on a flat line as far as development goes for like ugh, almost a thousand years, probably a thousand years. Uh, however, what's going to break them from this partially is, first of all, the influx of this information, right? The return of skepticism and secular thought and Greek science and all that. But not just that. This Protestant Reformation also contributes heavily. Why might the Protestant Reformation heavily contribute? Now think about this. I haven't told you this yet. If they're controlling information, why would this Protestant Reformation help spur a scientific revolution? Because it actually comes after. I mean, they actually overlap a little bit, but it's more uh, in, in the uh, after portions that it does. Because the Protestants were able to use some control from the Catholics. Okay. Okay, so like, what did the Protestants do different? So okay, Catholics are out in, in their regions, but uh, why does that necessarily mean all of a sudden they start inventing things? The Protestants allowed you to think for yourself in your own. Yeah, they weren't as controlling regarding the information. Now, I'm not saying that no Catholics thought of anything. Like Copernicus uh, thought of his stuff before the Protestant Reformation. Galileo was Catholic too, although he was punished for his ideas. He was put under house arrest and he was all, he literally went to depression, almost suicidal depression. depression. But um, a lot of the later discoveries uh, and innovations are going to come out of um, the Protestant areas. And it's not because Protestants are superior or better or whatever. But one thing they do in their, the states they have control of is they don't care as much about you refuting the Bible. So if you want to say, hey, uh, the Bible might be wrong about this thing or the church might be wrong about this thing, they're not going to be like, heretic, and then you know, try to stomp you out. They're going to hear you out. And if you're right... You know, they're, they're, more, they're more likely to go along with it. So what Protestantism does in these regions is it's going to allow new ideas that contradict some of the old Catholic ideas. It's not going to just stomp them out. It's going to let them develop and continue. All right, so a combination between these ideas returning from uh, the, the Middle East and North Africa, along with more relaxed um, policies towards new information, are going to allow a lot of these scientific revolution um, thinkers to um, continue developing new ideas, all right, without having to worry about being punished by the church or put under house arrest or burned at the stake for being a heretic. Because I mean, did I tell you what the Illuminati was? No. <laughs> I never told you what the Illuminati was. No, it's so random. Uh, no, it's not random. It's totally linked to this. So, all right, you every you high schoolers in Illuminati, man. <laughs> so like, uh, and 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 celebrities too, because they're so smart. Um, everyone's all caught up in the Illuminati and their mystique and what are they and oh they control things it's like no you're going to be sadly disappointed when you find out what the Illuminati are uh, the Illuminati are a bunch of people they're basically nerds that liked math and science but couldn't talk about it because somebody would punish them hmm. who would go after them to punish them for talking about scientific ideas Catholic. the Catholic Church so they'd have to meet in secret to talk about things that you might consider, well, maybe you guys don't consider it boring, but they would, they would literally meet to talk about ideas about the universe and mathematics and science. That was it. It was a secret science club. Oh. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm, I'm happy to destroy your, your dreams of what the Illuminati is. Because they, they have a lot of cryptic symbol, you know, but most of it's going to be based on symmetry. I mean, you guys have seen their symbols before. It's like the eyes and, and like the ruler and then the... Um, the other shape that I can't remember the name of. No, it's not the triangle. It's something else. The Freemason one. Yeah, the Freemason one. It, yeah, but they're, the point is they make all these plays at symmetry and angles and you know, things like that. They're they're trying to be clever. Uh, they work clever. Uh, but it's not like they have like billions of dollars and they control the political leaders of the world and all this crap. That's just not true. It, it, it's originally a bunch of nerds that would meet to uh, talk about science and math in secret. It was, it was Secret Science Club. That's what it was. <laughs> secret Science Club. All right, cool. Obviously, it's uh, changed a bit, uh, but it's that's what it is, really. All right. Now it more so means people that go against mainstream thought, but regardless, that was its origins, and that's who the Illuminati are and were. Okay. What was I saying? Oh, Society of Revolution. So... Here in the uh, 17th century, there are some ideas that precede this. Copernicus preceded this, and Galileo preceded this, but it really takes off in the 17th century um, as far as innovation goes. We'll just say 15, yeah, whatever, the 17th century. 
Even the 18. It's kind of hard to put a date on this because the people that have these ideas are really spread out. But to give you kind of an idea, there's a little overlap with the Renaissance and with um, the Protestant Reformation, and it goes a little further than both of them. All right, but it's going to start with uh, Copernicus, and he's the first one to really question, at least have a good argument for, why the we might not be the center of the universe. Right, so it used to be a geocentric model, meaning we all believed, the Catholic Church believed, and enforced the idea that we're the center of the universe because they believe the Bible said so, or, or, or whatever, and uh, anyone who said otherwise could be deemed a heretic. So this guy said otherwise, but he didn't just say it, he had some evidence for it, right? He observed the stars, he tracked their movement, and he noticed that, well, they would act a certain way. If they were orbiting us, there would be a, a specific pattern you could notice. All right, but he noticed that pattern did not line up with what he actually observed did not line up with what their pattern should be. Like if, if, if they are circling us, they should be trackable uh, in, in, a, in a certain pattern. But he noticed that they were not. All right, and so using uh, mathematics, I don't understand, and um, observation, he determined that uh, it looks like based on the patterns um, of the, the stars in the sky and the sun that we are the ones that are actually orbiting the sun so he's going to be the one to develop, um, and again, his, his argument was excellent. He's going to be the one that develops the heliocentric model. And again, the important thing is he didn't just base it on, I think this is what it is. I just feel it like it's none of that garbage, none of that intuition, judgment garbage. It's, uh, no, he based it on observation, uh, mathematics, and logic, which is uh, the fundamental principles of the scientific revolution. So you're basing knowledge not on how you feel or what old person or dead person said it. You're basing it on, can we prove it? Can we observe it? Can we test it? Can we use mathematics to uh, show that it's true? All right, so using experimentation, observation, math, or just general logic, uh, that's gonna be considered the source of knowledge. So again, I don't care if Aristotle said it or Socrates or Ptolemy or your grandpa said it, doesn't matter. Uh, if you can't prove it, it doesn't mean it's true, all right? And proving it means I should be able to observe it, experience it, test it, prove it with mathematics or logic, all right? And uh, they're gonna largely start that. Okay, did I hit the record on that? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank God. All righty, so heliocentric model. Um, who's gonna come along later though and take a telescope and refine it to the point that it can see so well into the sky that he's able to confirm that even though he's a Catholic and he doesn't want to be right, that uh, he is right and that Copernicus is also right. Galileo. Galileo, yeah. Among the many things he does, he refines the telescope. Uh, and he's not necessarily trying to prove Copernicus right, but he's just curious. He's like, is this guy right? Like, is that actually how it works? So he refines the telescope. Uh, observes the stars up close. He even has some of his assistants go blind looking at the sun. And uh, yep. I, think, I think their vision came back, but I do know that they definitely, at the very least, temporarily went blind. Uh, and they also saw, too, something that they didn't think was possible. They, they thought that all stars and the sun, etc., were perfect, like they were the heavens, and they were perfectly symmetrical and blemish-free, but they actually found spots on the sun, dark spots, which indicated imperfection. Uh, so that's another thing the Catholic Church didn't like. You're like, what does that even mean? But he's going to find out that, yes, he's going to confirm Copernicus. He's going to find some other things out. He's going to also find that not all celestial bodies, meaning like anything you can see in space or the sky uh, that's not in the atmosphere, all celestial bodies are not perfect. Not all celestial bodies are perfect. So he finds misshapen moons, or at least people after find misshapen moons and rocks and sunspots and all kinds of stuff. New planets that they didn't know existed, as you can see further now. So um, a lot of discoveries are going to uh, be surfaced, or are going to appear uh, because of his observation. All right, so that's Galileo. There's actually one other thing he does too. He disproves Aristotle, who, who asserted that heavier things fall faster than lighter things. It's not even inertia, actually. It's just gravity. So um, a, a, a bad test would be if I took a marker and a paper, and I'm like, look, 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 this marker's heavier than the paper, and look, I'll even show you guys, oh my gosh. Which one's hit the ground first? The marker does, all right? So therefore, we can assert that heavier objects fall faster. No, it doesn't, though. So there's a couple factors here. Uh, so if I use a light enough object, 
actually somebody already said it, air resistance is actually going to slow it down. So it makes it seem like it's falling slower. But if you took out the air, which they can't do back then, eventually they can make vacuum tubes and they can see. Like you can, if you guys ever did like the little kid science experiment where you put the feather and the penny in the, the, the vet, uh, tube and you suck the air out of it, and you like this, they fall at exactly the same speed. Um, those are uh, going to prove it. But he does it before that too. He takes a heavy rock and a tiny rock. So that should work then. If that, if that's true that uh, lighter objects fall slower, then a small light rock should fall slower than a large heavy rock. So he goes to the, the top of the tower of Pisa, goes to the edge, has a bunch of people observe, takes them off the tower, drops them, boom. Guess, one hit, guess which one hits the ground first? They hit the same time. There's no difference. So once you can eliminate the air resistance based on the density of the object, um, they show that there's no actual um, difference in the dropping speed. So he immediately is going to uh, start disproving things like that as well. So he disproves uh, Aristotle's theory of gravity. All right. And uh, that's just a few of the things that get started here with this scientific revolution. Were there any ex other examples in the notes? Descartes? Descartes. Uh, was there anything besides Descartes? Was there Newton? Yeah. yeah. Newton, okay. So uh, well, we're running a little short on time, so I'm going to do these ones kind of quickly. Uh, Descartes and Newton. <coughs> Newton's a badass, by the way. <laughs> Although, uh, he's, he's a weirdo. So he, he was one of the smartest people ever to walk the face of the earth. He uh, did some of the hardest stuff ever. It, it's really hard to create ideas that no one's ever thought of before that are actually viable and make the world better. He did it with several things. He did it with lights. <coughs> he invented calculus to think about things more uh, thoroughly and differently. Uh, so that you could actually figure out a lot of the things about gravity. Like he started, he's the one that like calculated gravity. Um, and they still use his formulas, you know, hundreds of years later because he was so spot on with them. Uh, he is going to be the one that invent, invents several things and he's made a lot of discoveries about light. He's going to find the formulas for gravity. He invents calculus. Some of you are like, damn it. But uh, calculus, he wouldn't have a lot of the technology we have without calculus. Calculus. Uh, he also, um, yeah, the, like the apple with the gravity. Uh, he's going to figure out several universal laws. And these are the things that we still use today in space at NASA and SpaceX and all these guys. They use his numbers and his formulas to calculate these things. He's going to figure out universal laws, meaning that there are certain things uh, that you can figure out based on your time and location. Einstein's going to blow this up later. We'll talk about that later in class. But uh, at the time, on Earth, they figured out a lot of uh, truisms about how you can figure out how fast something's going to fall or accelerate and movement and all these things. So he's going to develop several universal laws that we still use uh, to uh, determine how to send satellites into orbit, rocket ship, and missiles, and cars, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and that's going to be largely because of this guy. All right, and then Descartes, really quickly, is he's kind of based on logic here. He's going to be uh, one who sort of masters or at least codifies uh, deductive reasoning. So he's one that uh, is going to be able to develop a system of thought that is able to prove things based on uh, simple logic. So how do you know something is true? Uh, you kind of like reverse engineer it. Um, so what he would do was he actually reverse engineered all the way to the only thing you can actually know for sure. Um, so here, here's an example. He wanted to think about the most fundamental thing that he knows as true. All right, so he started doing this one day, and uh, he kept finding reasons to doubt everything. He's like, how do I know the table's there? I can feel it. I can see it. I can you know, hear it if something lands on it. I can taste it or touch it. I can probably smell it, too. But what's the problem with all those things? OK. How do I know that I'm not hallucinating? How do I know that I'm not dreaming? Do I? Are you dreaming right now? <laughs> How do you know you're not dreaming? What if, what, if, uh, what, if, what if I'm standing here in an empty classroom in a shuts down school and I'm talking to nobody? But in my mind, you're all here, right? How would I? I know you guys are like, oh no, do I exist? You do. Are you sure? 
I do, and he actually figured out. This is the one thing he figured out. Uh, he was very troubled by this because he realized that everything can be basically hallucinated, or your, your senses can be deceived. So you can miss see things, see things that aren't there, hear things that aren't there, you know, taste that. All those can be fooled, right? You don't know if you're dreaming. Um, uh, you could be hallucinating from something else. Uh, maybe you, huh, when you're when you're in your uh, garden back then, you accidentally grab some of those mushrooms, and then now you're now you're seeing things that aren't there for sure. So um, his assertion was. I don't know if anything's real. Like, I don't know if you're real. You could be a figment of my imagination. I have no idea. There's only one thing I can action. In fact, I don't even know if this is my body. Like, what if I'm, like I said, uh, dreaming or hallucinating or like my mind's hooked up to a computer somewhere and I'm in a totally different body and this is the projection that's given to my uh, brain from this computer program. Like, there's all kinds of like things that could possibly be true. Like, that's the whole matrix thing. But um, there's one thing that he found out, he deduced, that he knows for sure. Now, I don't know this about any of you, but he doesn't know this about any of you, but he knows this about himself. He knows he does exist. He doesn't know if he exists here. He doesn't know if this is his body, but he's independently thinking. He has a consciousness, all right? So whether or not these are our bodies, or that was his body, or this is actual reality, or whatever, I'm an independent thinker, and I can have thoughts. So that means that somebody else isn't controlling that. Right, my thoughts can only really come from me. So the fact that I'm independent and I'm conscious of my existence and I'm thinking about it and I have thoughts, that at very least means that somewhere, probably here, but somewhere I exist. All right, and that, that's what deduction is. So it's like going back as far as you can about what you know is absolutely true, all right? And he went back as far as existence. And that was the only thing he, he said he could actually know for sure was that he existed because he could think. He had independent uh, creative thoughts. All right, that, that's deductive reason. Anyways, so uh, have fun with that Pandora's box of thought, questioning if <laughs> this is reality or not and all that, and if your parents are your parents and all that. So <laughs> We'll cut it at that, huh? Take a quick break. All right, uh, two weeks ago, we talked about the Muslim gunpowder, gunpowder empires, or you did, I wasn't here. The Muslim gunpowder empires, as well as centralization and resistance to uh, that centralization from governments and uh, indigenous people. So, put that real quick. So what were my three gunpowder empires? Ottoman Empire. Ottoman. Safavid. Safavid. Another one? Mughal. Mughal, yeah, that's correct. All right, which one was in India? Mughal. Mughal. All right. Nice. Uh, which one was in the, uh, like the last Persian dynasty? Safavid. And then we have Ottoman Empire over here. All right. Okay. So let's do Ottoman first. <coughs> All right, Ottoman's been around for a while. They used to be an emirate in uh, uh, the, what was the Seljuk Empire after the uh, Mongols came in. And they're the ones that conquered the rest of the Turks and sort of started the Ottoman Empire. Uh, I think it goes back as far as 1199, but we'll, we'll start them from when they, yeah, we'll just say that's fine. Let's say 1199, even though they weren't large yet. Uh, all the way until 1922, so this is a, a, a very long duration. Uh, a very, uh, an empire lasts a long time. So, Ottoman Empire. All right, so they're Turks. They are what type, what religion specifically? Sunni Muslim. Sunni Muslim, yeah. That's important because they're gonna be uh, at odds, conflicting with a, a neighboring Shia empire. <coughs> Nice, okay. Ruled by a? Caliphate. Not a caliph. Sultan. Sultan. Sultan, nice. Sultan. I'm not sure if they consider themselves caliphs, but ooh, they're sultans. Okay, cool. Ruled by a sultan. Uh, there are quite a few uh, great Ottoman sultans, but what was the one that expanded them the most and got them furthest into Europe before getting stopped at Vienna? Suleiman the Magnificent. Yeah, he's the guy with the onion hat, if you've ever seen the picture. <laughs> So he was around in the uh, 16th century. And there was two points where the Ottoman Empire was like at their largest. Uh, I think 1683 was technically the largest, but both times they were stopped by a uh, Christian uh, coalition in Vienna uh, in 15, I think the exact, I think it's 1529 and 1683. Uh, so they're gonna stop there, but they're going to seize quite a bit of territory. Uh, and they are going to be thwarted by the 
Catholic forces at Vienna twice, and they also get, are thwarted on the oceans uh, in the Mediterranean near Greece to, uh, where's that from? Lepanto, yeah, so stopped, as far as Europe goes anyway, stopped at Vienna times two, and then Lepanto uh, as far as the fight by, by sea goes, that's by land. All right, cool. So, uh, but they're going to be a major threat to Europe for a long time, but they're not just fighting Europeans. They're also fighting on the Eastern Front. Uh, who are they fighting on the uh, Eastern Front? South of it. The South of it, right. And why are they uh, fighting the South of it, uh, who are well, also they're Muslim? So the Shia. Shia. Yeah, versus the Shia uh, South of it Empire. And uh, what do we call that series of conflicts that goes on and off for 200 years and depletes both empires substantially of people and resources? Yeah, exactly. And that's going to be, a, like I said, roughly two centuries long on and off series of conflicts. Some uh, back and forth. I think the Ottomans usually had got the better end of it, but I know there's a few times that the Soft had definitely had some victories and uh, pushed in and took some of their territory too. Uh, so the Ottoman Safavid conflicts. And those are going on between the 1500s and the 1700s. Uh, again, and the real. Struggle is the fact that they are different versions of uh, Islam, and of course they're still um, fighting for territory, for political and economic power. All right, cool. Uh, so that's basically how they expanded and came to be one of their greatest rulers. What about in the Ottoman Empire, though? How do they treat Christians? Now, don't just give me a descriptor like good or bad, like tell me exactly what they're doing. Well, actually, before you even answer that, what are they doing that other Muslim states used to do uh, as far as like the old caliphates and things like that? The Jizya tax and yep. the Yep, so they still had that Jizya tax and Dimi status, which again is that second class status, and uh, tax uh, for being a non-Muslim uh, Christian or a Jew, right? So that is going to be maintained from the previous Muslim states, the caliphates. Uh, what's the different one, though? This is the one that gets them their most... They obviously are imperial. That means they conquer and, and, and destroy other peoples and nations and incorporate them, but this is probably one of their most obvious... Uh, human rights violations, uh, one that you might paint them as the bad guy pretty clearly in this one. So what are they doing to Christians specifically in this Balkan region, which is their most troublesome region? These are the people that are the least happy to be controlled. Uh, blood tax. Yep, it's called the blood tax, right, the Devshirmi or Devshirm. Also known as the blood tax. So somebody tell me what that is. This terrible, terrible practice that gets a lot of negative, uh, uh, well, gets a lot of criticism, and right, rightfully so. It's when they take Yeah, it's almost like a, a human tax. When they, uh, before the age of eight, they come into these Christian areas and they take their uh, sons. And what do they do with their sons? So, not all of them. Some are be castrated, yeah. So the, the harem guards, which is again like the, the female government official and royal family, uh, uh, wives and, and, and children, uh, they're going to be in the harem and protected by castrated guards, yeah. Not all of them are castrated, though, but yes, that does happen to some. Yeah, what is that elite group of uh, fighters called, though? Janissaries. Janissaries, right. So they're going to take uh, eight-year-old Christian boys. Do they leave them Christian? No. No, they convert them to Islam by, by force. <coughs> and they are going to uh, uh, make a, an elite military unit known as the Janissaries. All right, and these Janissaries, what, what's the purpose of these? Why would I, why would I be... What is the purpose? To obviously, want an elite military, unit, but like, why are they forming this out of the blue? Because they already were doing well militaristically. What's the purpose of this, other than to keep the Christians from, or to try to keep Christians from rising up against them? To have a loyal army and all that. Why? Uh, to fight the south of it. Mm, they're already willing to fight the south of it. It's actually not so much to fight external powers as, <clears throat> as internal foes. Why? Why, what's the point? Of, I know I wasn't here to explain this to you, but I'm going to see if you know. Defeat of rebelling nobles and enemies. There we go. So the Sultan is going to be, of course, challenged by uh, uh, wealthy Timars or uh, other nobles, whether they're Christian or Muslim. It could be Turkic, or they could be uh, Christian. Uh, regardless, the Sultan wants a force that's loyal just to him, so that if these uh, Timars or nobles or Christians try to rebel, they're not, hopefully, going to uh, help them out. They're going to be... Uh, trained to be loyal just to the sultan to maintain his power uh, and they're going to be the best most well-equipped units too so <clears throat> their purpose was to protect sultan 
versus internal, not so much external, internal uh, struggles. I mean, it's not like they're not going to use them against foreign powers, but they're more so there to keep people in the empire straight. All right, cool. We understand the blood tax and its purpose? Yes. Nice. Next, since we already mentioned them anyway, uh, Safavid Empire. This one's the 15 or the 16. I don't remember the exact year of Hoover, I don't remember the exact year I had. 1506 to 1736. All right, this is the last square, actually. This is the last unified, independent Persian Empire. All right? Uh, and we already mentioned they are Shia Islam, right? So Shia, and uh, this is going to form the modern day identity of which country? Iran. Iran. Yeah, Iran. Nice. And uh, who's? It's not a sultan that rules them. Who's going to rule uh, this dynasty? The Shah. The Shah, right? The Shah. And that's not going to fall until 1979 during the Iranian or Islamic Revolution, uh, because the Shah was financially supported by the United States, and they did not like that. So they kicked him out and started a Sharia law theocracy. <clears throat> All right, so Shah was the monarch. And um, they're gonna struggle here in this Central Asia, Persia region, uh, and they're gonna be embroiled and caught up in this exact same conflict, obviously, because they're the other side of it uh, during this, <clears throat> um, oh, sorry, not the Safavid Empire, I'm gonna highlight this, the Ottoman Safavid conflicts, there we go. And uh, what's the impact of these conflicts on both empires? Because again, we don't just want to know like what it is. We want to know, like its historical impact. It depletes both of their resources. Massively. Yep, and leaves them vulnerable to what or who? Ah, I don't know that one, do you? Who does it leave it vulnerable to? They become imperialized by Western forces, and honestly, so do these guys as well. It just takes a little longer. All right, so you eventually have the British and Russians coming in and carving up this, and you have. Um, many different European powers, the French, the British, the Italians, uh, the Russians, the Austrians, all carving up the Ottoman Empire as the um, centuries go on. So does anybody know, by the way, this is, this is ahead. Does anybody know the event or series of events that propels Europe far ahead of the rest of the world technologically and allows them to sort of take over the world, at least for a period of time? Industrialization. Yeah, industrialization, right? So first commercialization and then industrialization. Uh, then they start rolling out with uh, a bunch of highly advanced technology uh, cheaply so that all of them have it and they have a, a massive advantage over these other empires. So that's going to weaken them, obviously, and that's going to make it much easier for European powers uh, against the Soviet Empire, the British and Russians, and against the Ottoman Empire, pre pretty much everybody, uh, except for maybe Germany because they're a little late to the game, uh, carving them up. So that's how those two are going to rise and fall. And lastly, with the Mughals. They're the 1500s to the 1800s as well. I don't know the exact years. Let me write down. 1526 to 57. 1857. All right. Um, this is going to be the last independent Indian empire, but they're not going to be Hindu. They are what? Turco-Mongol. Okay, that's that's true. We're talking about ethnicity. They're Turco-Mongol. But uh, what religion? Islam, right. They're an Islamic empire, a Muslim state. Ah, but what was the old empire that was there that was also Muslim that struggled to, uh, I guess, coexist with the uh, Hindu population? The Delhi Sultanate. Yeah, the Delhi Sultanate. So what, what do the Mughals do that's so much better? Because they are a lot more cohesive. It, I realize that the duration of the empire is about the same, but they are uh, marked by far less conflict. They're yeah, they're much more tolerant of the uh, majority Hindu population. All right. In fact, also, they have a great system for making sure those local Indian princes uh, and officials don't try to kick them out. How do they keep them happy? In fact, how do they actually make their lives more powerful and enjoyable? What is the system they set up uh, along with the central government to keep these local rulers happy and loyal? Zamindar. Yeah. Is that how you say it? In, uh, Zamindar. Yeah. Z I always call him Zamindar, but Zamindar. I'm just going to keep saying Zamindar. Uh, so Zamindars are local officials or princes, uh, most of them Hindu, uh, non-Muslim, but they were still loyal to the Mughal uh, central government, even though they were Muslim and they were Turkic, uh, Mongolic, they're gonna be loyal. Why would they still be loyal to these guys? What are they doing? How are they, how are they benefiting? This was explained to you by the sub. 
or Julia, actually. Do we still allow some local authority? Okay, that's true, but that's not gaining anything. That's just keeping what you have. How do they gain? Government positions. Okay, what's their role? Uh, you guys have to know this. This is like super important. It's one of the major uh, objectives of the AP World Curriculum. Tax collection. Yeah. Okay. So they're the tax collectors essentially for the central government. So are these guys mostly Muslim, uh, Turco Mongols? No, no. No. What are they mostly? Hindu, like local rulers, right? So they're going to be tax collectors for the moguls. And they do get to keep their local authority. All right, so they're rewarded for this with uh, property uh, and money of their own. So did their situation get better or worse? Better. It got better, right. So they're more or less likely to cooperate with the central government. More. more. Right, yeah, more. I only saw a couple of you say more, but like, think about it. You get to keep your religion. You keep your local authority, and you actually have uh, more power and wealth. Does that sound like a good recipe for keeping them happy? No. Nope. It does, right? Delhi Sultan was the opposite. They lost power, they lost their religion, and they, they, they had to, to fight for it essentially, so that made it a lot less cooperative. Okay, and that's going to define the larger this Mughal Empire. That's going to lead to a lot more uh, stability. And when things are more stable, what tends to happen inside of these states? Trade booms. Yes, the economy is good. Why would the economy get better? Just because my government is stable. They don't have to worry about like dying. Yeah, you're not so worried about being invaded or dying or defending your territory because there's laws and rules and people enforce it. You can focus more on your individual and family life and your career or whatever. Because I mean, like, that's how our lives are now. You don't wake up thinking, man, I hope the person next to me doesn't just kill me, take my stuff, and burn my house down. <laughs> like, yeah, it's a possibility, but it's really rare because we have a series of laws and police force that would punish them for that. Uh, so, uh, stability is going to also um, increase economic growth. Now, it's not quite the uh, Indian uh, golden age like it was under the Gupta, um, which actually we didn't really talk about because they hacked it off the AP world, but uh, it's still going to be a good era for Indian culture. However, there's two main groups that are going to pick away and chisel away at this empire until it's gone completely and owned uh, by a company, actually. Uh, what are these two groups? Uh, you probably know one of them, at least. British East India. Yeah, the British East India Company, a charter company, is going to, through warfare and diplomacy, slowly take all the territory away from the uh, Mughals and later Maratha Confederacy. That's the second one, by the way. And uh, they're going to control what is now Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, and India as a company. A charter company is going to control all of that, uh, which is pretty uh, crazy, actually. So, chiseled away. I don't have to spell chiseled, by the way. I'm going to make it up. That looks like chiseled. Away by British East India Company and uh, a group of Hindu states in the West known as the Maratha Confederacy. The Maratha Confederacy. I first learned about those in Age of Empires. I had no idea who they were, but I learned about them when I was 19 when I played video games. So, uh, and then I read about them here. I was like, oh, I know them from the video game. <clears throat> All right, so that's them. Any questions about the Muslim states? Uh, real quickly, how did the Ottoman Empire sultans demonstrate their power and authority? How did they do it through uh, culture uh, or architecture or art or however they did it? Mini portraits. Mini portraits, right? And what about the Mughal Empire? The Say yeah, go ahead and say it. Uh, yeah, and Taj Mahal would be an example of what? Art? Architecture? Architecture, architecture right. Grand architecture. Taj Mahal. Not a palace, by the way. Tomb. Okay, cool. Any questions about the Muslim states? All right, sweet. We're going at a good pace. Hopefully we can do this in less than the two hours that we have allotted. I think we can. I want to, and I know you do, so. <laughs> All right. So, moving along. One of the big themes in the, um, did we ever talk about Louis XIV and Philip? Yeah. yeah. Like, on the study hall, or did, I, did you just talk about it with the? I mean, you briefly. So it's just like tiny bit. Let me make sure. I don't want to actually skim over this and skip it for YouTube. Oh, yeah. No, we didn't cover it in the study hall, so I'll cover that real quick. One of the major themes of this early modern era, 1450 to 1750, is going to be uh, increased power of the monarch and centralization, except for one place, actually two, but one place is going to be an exception right here, and also the Netherlands too, but 
those two places are going to be the exceptions uh, to this centralization thing. So centralization, what does that mean exactly? Unified political entity. Yes, so we're not talking like a bunch of like local feudal kingdoms or tiny empires or city states. We're talking about one single state that's unified under a one government. In this case, it's going to be mostly monarchs. All right, so that's going to be a major theme here. So um, again, not local rulers, but a unified central authority. And overwhelming majority of them are going to be monarchs in this case. All right, so, ooh, so the old feudal system, actually, it's still going. The hierarchy, we don't care about these right now. So top two. Monarch. Monarch? Nobles. Nobles. Uh, is the monarch dependent on the nobles? Yes. Yes, he is. How is he or she uh, dependent on the nobles? Provide them army. Okay, yeah, so they're going to contribute troops, right? When they, uh, when they're, uh, uh, what do they call it? When they call for, when they, it's fuel to use the, uh, the term for the allegiance. There's a term for like when they call on them for aid. I can't remember what it is. Whatever it is. When they call them for aid, they're supposed to send soldiers. All right. Um, and then what else do they rely upon them for? Taxes. Taxes. So are people like dishing out money, printed money in Europe at the time? No. Not really. What is, what is most of their currency in the form of? Grains. Grains, Grains yes. Could you guys know this? Hold on. So that's a, uh, definitely the monarch has the authority, but at any point that they want to, they could just say no, right? <clears throat> and potentially ally against the monarch and overthrow them. Could that possibly happen? Yes. Yeah, it happened plenty of times. So a lot of the monarchs of Europe don't like that idea. So they're going to try to take some of that authority from the nobles uh, and give it exclusively <clears throat> to them. So things like the right to tax, uh, things like uh, having a standing army loyal just to the monarch and not spread amongst all the lords. All right, and that's going to greatly enhance their power. So two monarchs in Europe. So I talk about anything outside of Europe? No. Oh, kind of. The sultan. Well, whatever. Two monarchs in Europe are going to start this process. So who's my monarch in Spain and who's my monarch in France? Boom. Louis XIV. And Philip, II. Philip II, yeah. So who's in Spain? Philip. Which one's in Spain? Philip. Philip. Philip, yeah. All right, and he's the 16th century, and Louis is the 17th century. We'll talk more about them in Euro, but let's actually get some info on them now. All right. So, Philip is going to control his state of Spain uh, through control of religion. So what is he going to do in Spain? Julia tried to talk about it, but then she got the Inquisition thing screwed up. Uh, what, what happens in Spain specifically that's going to strengthen the monarch's control of that state in particular? Right. Dunno? Rally the Christians to kick out the Jews. Okay, there you go. That's actually Ferdinand and Isabella, but yes, okay. It does have to do with Christianity and unifying Christianity. So before him, Ferdinand and Isabella are going to unite the uh, Christians of uh, Spain against the Muslims that are there from the old Umayyad invaders, the Moors, yep, kicking them out. That's called Reconquista. But uh, there's still a bunch of, well, actually, tell me, who might be in Spain that is not a Catholic in the 1500s? Jews, yes. Those are there from the old Jewish diaspora. Absolutely. Who else might still be there? The uh, Moors. Yeah, you still got some uh, Arabic uh, or uh, Muslim uh, people there, right? What else might be there in the 1600s that the Catholics might not want to be there? Protestants. Yeah, any Protestants. Not that there's a ton of them, but there are some. Okay. So what is uh, uh, Philip going to um, begin using against these Protestants, Jews, and uh, uh, Moors, leftover Moors? Muslims, essentially. You say, welcome, guys. Just be nice, and you guys can stay. Spanish Inquisition. Yes, this is where we start seeing the Inquisition being used, okay? Uh, I know we haven't talked about it yet, but the Protestant Reformation, I think I did mention that, actually. The Council of Trent, for that huge 20-year meeting, to decide that, no, they disagree with everything the Protestants oh, yeah. said. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so at that point, they tell every Catholic monarch, just like Philip II, 
to get rid of all non-Catholics, right? And then they would use the Inquisition to do that. So he enforces uh, two things. He enforces what's called the Index of Prohibited Books. Anybody know what that is? Basically, in Protestant and scientific literature. Wait, why scientific? Because it might... Against the Catholic Church. Yeah, scientific ideas back then contradicted the Bible and the Catholic Church's position. So those were heretical, and so were Protestant books. So this index of prohibited books was enforced. If you were caught with those books, you could be punished by imprisonment or death. All right? And then you guys already mentioned the Inquisition. What's the Inquisition do? It means to question. What's the Inquisition do? Basically, the team. It's kind of like a SWAT team without the guns. What's the Inquisition do? Turn up force. Oh, I give a whole explanation about how they did all these things to these people, and you don't remember any of it? They basically like punish or kill anyone that isn't Catholic. How though? It's more sim it's more complex than just oh, I'm gonna punish you. Oh, well, they, oh. Would, they capture them and then torture them until they commit or they, they confess oh. that they're a her oh. heretic. Heretic, yeah. So it isn't just like we catch you and imprison you. <laughs> we catch you, and if we caught you, you're guilty. Uh, they catch you and they torture you to <coughs> confess, right? And anybody knows anything about torture, you're eventually going to confess to things you didn't do, so the torture stops. Right. So they torture till they confess. No, their soul is clean. They can go home now. No, no. no what happens? They just take part of the stake, right? Exactly. All right. So next vivid book, Prohibited books, and the Spanish Inquisition are going to be used uh, to uh, chase out any non-Catholics. And you're like, well, how does that strengthen his power? Well, number one, the fact that he can order these things to happen, put it into law. Uh, use the Inquisition to chase out any non-Catholics. That's a large demonstration of one's authority. Uh, but also, if you remove, I'm not saying this is a good thing because it's actually a bad thing. Uh, if you remove all people that disagree with your beliefs, that's going to make you and your group that remains, and in this case Catholics, more unified because they, they all agree with each other essentially. So they're not worrying about them being heretics or uh, uh, mischievous because they there's sort of a, a, a bond uh, or trust that's put into place so that's how Philip's gonna enhance his power makes Spain almost entirely Catholic and he also demonstrates he has the authority to enforce this index of prohibited books and use the Inquisition against his uh, at least religious enemies all right Louis XIV more complicated but we don't have too much time to go over exactly what he did he's going to take the nobles who were sharing power and he's basically going to say, uh, no, that's all my power now. So, just like, actually it's very similar to what happened with the Mughal Empire with the Zamindars. So, what he's going to do is he's going to take these nobles that could be a threat to him, and he's going to say, all right, I'm not going to just like kill you, because then you'll just hate me and fight against me for sure. So he's actually going to enhance their, uh, enhance power and wealth. And he's going to do that by including them in the government, the central government. So not only do they get to keep their old uh, estates, their old manor, so they still are like the lords of that area and, and they have local authority, so that, that stays, but they also gain central authority too. So he makes them part of the bureaucracy. Remember what a bureaucracy is, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, part of the government, uh, tax collecting, for example. But he also is going to put them into the military. So he's gonna have one standing military that's loyal to him, but who do you think the generals and colonels and lieutenants are gonna be? The nobles. nobles, exactly. So he's going to make them loyal by enhancing their power. So they keep local authority, check, but they actually gain power. And again, what are the two major ways they gain power? Central positions. Central positions? Give me an example. Tax. Tax collectors, okay. So they're, they're part of the bureaucracy, administration, all right? They're in the central government. That's more power and authority than they had before over just their territory. So they're part of the central government. So tax collecting is an example. And what was the other way that he's going to enhance his own power? The his military. The generals. And okay, they're going to be the uh, officers, but uh, is there going to be a bunch of troops he has to call from his uh, fellow lords? Uh, to come no, to his... no, no. Then what are they going to have now in France? One, one, army. one standing army. That's their job. They're professional soldiers loyal to the king. All right, so it's, uh, it's not like a janissary force necessarily, but it's a group of professional soldiers that are loyal to the king, not their individual lords. All right, so uh, standing army plus uh, nobles as officers. And that's going to go for a long time until Napoleon figures out it's stupid to just make officers uh, nobles because some of them are idiots. It's better to promote people who are good at what they do. Uh, and that's why he starts wrecking everybody in Europe, uh, along with the fact that he's really good himself. That's not until later, though. Okay. Do we understand Louis and Philip? 
Yes. All right. What's a Timar? Oh, a land grant. Nice. Where? Ottoman Empire. To who? <coughs> to Timurids. Okay, they're called Timurids when they get it, but like, yeah, someone said soldiers. That's the reward for uh, participating in. That's not the right word. Serving. Serving. Thank you. Serving in the uh, Ottoman army. Uh, that's a land grant. But the problem was, these uh, Timurids, the people, are getting too powerful. Uh, they're like a new social class. And they're becoming too powerful themselves to the point that they might challenge these sultans. So what does he start doing that uh, the sultans start doing that limits their power? What does he do with these Timurids? He doesn't get rid of them, but what does he do with them? Them. Yeah, he starts dividing them. So instead of giving you like this huge chunk of land, you get your own thing, he starts splitting it between them. And he also makes it so that they're not like continuous. Like you don't get a whole city, you get part of a city and the land out of it. So you don't like own that entire area. All right, so he's going to uh, start splitting these land grants to reduce power. And hey, you guys probably remember this. There was a Russian monarch who didn't like the uh, boyars, the uh, local rulers and nobles that had a lot of authority. Uh, who was he? I'm the Terrible. Yeah, I'm the Terrible, I'm the Fourth. And what's he gonna do about these uh, um, uh, boyars that he doesn't like? The Oprachina. Oprachina, what's that? It's kind of like a secret police force in that he would go out and persecute and take the land and possessions and life of these uh, boyars. So he's gonna essentially wipe out, out boyar class, or at least a lot of it. Uh, and again, that's called the Opportunity Terror. Bless you. All right. <clears throat> so those are all examples of centralization. All right. So then we're going to talk about resistance to that, and then we'll, we'll take a brief break and, and finish after. So um, who do I start with? I think I start with the Fraun and the Catalan revolts. Yes, I do. And the Gentry. And then Medicon and Zinga. OK. All right. Not all nobles are going to take this line down. In fact, in Spain and in France, we're going to see examples of the nobles actively resisted, like took their armies, what they had of them, and tried to fight the uh, forces of the monarch and the other nobles. All right, so there's two examples. They both go different ways. First one is the Catalan revolts during the Thirty Years' War. All right, and the other one is, what's the one in France? The Fronde. The Fronde, yeah. Actually, I think they're both during the Thirty Years' War. So in both cases, the nobles are very much tired of this 30 years war because it's very expensive. Uh, cost them a lot of soldiers, a lot of money, uh, a lot of death, a lot of famine, all these issues that come along with long drawn out wars. So some of them aren't too happy, especially the peoples of Catalonia, which is roughly this region right here. And that is Spain's most lucrative, wealthy, powerful province. All right, so losing these guys is bad. And it's gonna be bad for Spain. So they're going to uh, rise up against Spanish monarchy. And for the same reason, the French nobles are going to rise up against the French monarchy. All right, how does the Fronde go? The rebellion loses. The rebellion loses. You know what's important, though, is there was a very young prince at the time who got to see all this happening, who would later become a king and control these nobles. Louis XIV. Louis XIV, yeah. So Louis XIV was but a wee little child when these were going on. And he remembered how his dad had to deal with these rebels and how they had to move and they were worried about losing and dying. So he's gonna make sure when he's king, they're not able to do that. All right, so that's a big motivator for him. Regardless, what's gonna happen here is a, a victory for the monarchy. So is that gonna help or hurt noble power in France? Hurt, hurt. It's gonna hurt, obviously lost. Actually, let me, let me rephrase that. Help or hurt monarchical power. Oh. The power of the monarch. Oh. That's going to help, oh. yeah. So up monarch. Spain, different. Very different result. The Cat people of Catalonia, being on the border of France, get some help from France. How do we know that the French don't like the Spanish, by the way? Because Spain is number one and they want to be number one. That's true, but give me a, an actual example where they acted against Spain when they probably should have, at least theologically, helped them out. 30 Years' War, right? They joined the Protestant side just to uh, take a piece of Spain, which they do successfully. So they help out the people of Catalonia. They are victorious. And what we're going to see here is some nobles of Cat. 
victorious. So two bad, two, two negative developments here. Number one, Spain loses their uh, best province, their most lucrative, wealthy province. Province, man, I can't speak. And what happens to monarchical power? Up or down? Oh, well, yeah. yeah, and that's the end of Spain, slowly. Uh, and the beginning of France, slowly, as well. All right, cool, so that's two examples. We have one more example that doesn't necessarily weaken the country, but it definitely weakens the monarch. All right, and that is, already circled it. Who's, that? Who's the country that uh, succeeds in taking power from the monarch but not destroying the country itself? Britain. Britain. Britain, yeah, England. I think I didn't know that. It's circled. Goodness <laughs> sakes. I know my map's better than that. England. Did they talk about the civil English Civil War? No. No? no. 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 Not at all? Like, it wasn't in the notes? No. Well, I'm going to tell you anyway. So... English Civil War, 1642 to 1650-something. Can't really hear. Mid-17th century. Uh, here's how this one goes. So we have a really rich merchant class that's self-made. They own property. They trade with the New World. They got really rich all by themselves, and uh, they have a lot of power. They're not nobles, though. What is that called? Gentry. 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 You know that, at least. Gentry. So after a while, this gentry class... Are they allowed to participate in the government and rule and have no, authority? No. no. Even though, after a while, they start becoming more wealthy and powerful than the nobles, right, that have this power and authority. So the gentry, not happy with that, all right? But they have a lot of money. So who's going to want to collect taxes from them? No. The monarch specifically, yes. But to do that, they have to be in parliament, but they can't join parliament because they're not nobles. So they're like, ah, what's the problem here? So... This is where Parliament's going to change in European history. And this is the beginning of the 17th century. I think it's under James I. Don't quote me, though. Parliament's going to change. So it was all nobles and clergy before. Remember the Anglican Church. No regular people. Right? Regular thieves. No regular people. Didn't happen. But if the king wants to tax them, he's got to have them in Parliament so he knows who they are. And they participate in the government, and then you can collect taxes, revenue from them. So they have to split parliament into two houses. So what happens to this, uh, uh, these nobles and, and clergy? What, what house do they become? Oh, oh, there you go. You're like, oh, that's why. This becomes? House of Commons. House of Commons. Sweet. Now, now the king can tax these people. Hooray! Yay for the monarch. Ooh, but bad for the monarch. Because... Who now has some authority and say in the government? The people. The regular people, right? And the gentry class are always changing. You always get new people who are rich and falling out of it. Uh, so it's going to be ever, ever changing. But also, these guys are a bit more, what's we're looking for? Stubborn, I guess? Because they earned it themselves. So they're not so <coughs> willing to... It's one thing if you're handed a bunch of money in estates from your family, like your, your dad or your mom or whatever. You're like, oh, okay, that's cool. You know, I don't mind giving up some of it or whatever. But it's different when you like start from nothing and work your way up. Like you don't really just want to give away stuff. So these guys, it turns out, are going to be way more. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Miserly. Like uh, miserly means like penny pinchers kind of. Oh. So they're they're not like uh, they're not so willing to give you money. All right. So when the monarch, later monarchs like Charles the First, for example, starts blowing a lot of money on stuff for his estate and in wars against Scotland, uh, they're going to be like, hey, hey, hey. hey. You're bad with money. We don't want to give you any more. In fact, we want actually to uh, change things so that you can't just collect taxes from us. We want to be able to say no, all right, because they couldn't technically say no at the time. That's what's going to start this English Civil War, all right? So I realize we've talked about the monarchs and all that, but just know this. There is a monarch in the 1640s. His name is Charles I, and he's bad with money. Blows it on himself and his estate. Uh, blows it uh, against uh, the Scottish in a series of wars against them that didn't necessarily need to happen. So now the House of Commons is like, no, 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 no. We don't want to just hand you money. You're wasting it. We want to be able to tell you no. All right? So how do you think the uh, king, Charles I, likes uh, this news, that the House of Commons wants the ability to tell him no? He's not going to like that. All right, so what he's going to do is, and I realize I'm explaining a really complicated event in a very short amount of time, but what he does when, uh, so we got the gentry and the House of Commons, they're in Parliament now. 
Charles I is bad with money, and they're like, no, we don't want to just hand you money anymore. We want the ability to say no. Uh, so Charles's response to that is going to be to not, not break up when you uh, disperse. I guess just disperse. He's going to try to end Parliament, and he's going to arrest some of these House of Commons members. All right, which is well, I don't know if it's necessarily legal in, any, in, uh, in England at the time, but they did not like it. So once Charles the First attempts to uh, attempts disband, that's the word I was looking for. Attempts to disband and arrest uh, the common, House of Commons, or at least certain members of them, how do you think the gentry are going to receive that? The message that they have to go home, and the ones that were really loud actually are going to be arrested. How do you think they're going to they gonna take that sit down like, oh, dang, we tried. No. No, protest. no they're going to, no, more than protest. They're actually going to act, use their superior money and power to fight directly against the king. So they're going to build up their armies, and they're going to have some support from the nobles who also don't want the king doing as much as he does. And some nobles are going to stay loyal to the king. And you're going to have a fight between the uh, gentry and some nobles versus the monarch and some nobles. All right. Uh, who do you think wins? Gentry. Why? Yeah. yeah, they do. And they prove to be more capable on the battlefield, too. Uh, they got a name, Oliver Crom Cromwell, who, uh, by the way, turns out to be kind of a tyrant, but really good uh, militaristically. And uh, they're going to defeat the king's forces. And not only do they defeat them, they shock all of Europe when they uh, declare him a, uh, a traitor and uh, decapitate him they, uh, in public. And so Europe has that's never happened in Europe at the time. They're like, what? Regular people rose up, beat the king, and then chopped his head off. Like, they, they couldn't believe it. Uh, so, I'm skipping a lot of events, like the period of time where Oliver Cromwell kind of ruled as a Republican uh, authoritarian. We don't care about that. What we care about is the king, in this conflict, this English Civil War, uh, he lo loses his life. All right? And they do invite his son, Charles II, to come back and be king, but there's a, an asterisk on it. What do you think the asterisk on coming back to be the monarch's going to be? If they allow him to come back and rule, what is he going to have to do or not do, do you think? The gentry can say no to him. Yeah, exactly. So the uh, gentry, um, the House of Commons, is going to have a lot more power and authority. So the monarch's going to lose power, and the, the uh, parliament, House of Commons, are going to gain power. All right, so that's an example of <clears throat> successful resistance uh, against the monarchy. But that doesn't like, not in the case, in the case of Spain, like that weaken them all, all around. This actually strengthens England because they're going to start passing a lot more laws that help the gentry uh, do what they do best, and that is uh, get rich and uh, make good armies. All right, so that's what they're going to do. English Civil War, uh, increase in power for the parliament, uh, decrease for the monarch. All right, English war, English Civil War kind of makes sense a little bit? Yeah. All right, you don't even know all the details, just there's House of Commons. King said, give me more money. House of Commons said, we don't want to. They fought. King lost. Now House of Commons can say no. Make sense? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, is that my only example of resistance in Europe? Yep. Those are the two. The last two examples before we take our break are resistance to... Uh, Colonial powers, actually. So I got one in Angola. That's just not that large. It's a, uh, a union of states against the Portuguese. And we also have a fight here in the English colonies uh, versus the uh, American Indians there. So uh, do you guys remember what the name of the conflict versus the settlers in the English colonies was? Metacom's War. Metacom's War. It's also known as King Philip's War, by the way. <clears throat> because that was also his name. Uh, he was so friendly with the settlers at one point, he adopted their name, but then he got upset, obviously later, uh, enough to go to war with them. And then he had Metacom's War, and that was the most destructive settler versus American Indian War, by the way, in English history. That's where uh, there were heavy losses on both sides. The settlers ended up winning, uh, but uh, they lost a lot of towns and settlement homes and things like that. Okay, Metacom's War, example of resistance, unsuccessful, but resistance nonetheless, to colonial powers. And uh, who was the uh, resistor here in Angola, who uh, actually was a really good diplomat, uh, but couldn't muster up the uh, numbers and technology to take on the Portuguese directly? Yeah, 
It's a uh, Ana Nzinga. I'm sure it's pronounced something different in the region of Angola, but that's how my very American English is going to pronounce it. All right, and that's in the 17th century. No, 16th century. And again, who's she uh, leading resistance against? Portuguese. The Portuguese. Portuguese. Okay. Again, unsuccessful, but they, uh, they like putting in examples of resistance even if it doesn't work. Um, I don't know why, but they just do. So, any questions about resistance to colonial powers? Cool, we'll do the society stuff after the break. Let's check back in seven minutes. Uh, there's some African states uh, that we're going to talk about real quick. We've got a, the uh, Songhai or Songhai? Songhai or Songhai? Songhai. Uh, we have the Asante. Or Asante. As well as the Kingdom of the Congo. These are your major African states in the early modern era. So I shall write that here. Song. Okay. We have the Asante. Oops. Yes. And the uh, Kingdom of the Congo with a K. All right, cool. So okay. they're going to, I'm sure the years is only the exact years of Morocco. 1592. Uh, yeah, they're the ones that get knocked out by Morocco. Correct. All right, so it's actually 1464 to 1592. Asante. 1620. I do believe there was some interference with the British uh, and French uh, colonial powers, but uh, they still were able to maintain the rulers. 1957, in the Congo, uh, from the 16th to 19th centuries. All right. So, so I saw these names right. Well, I got them up here. In the money Congo. All right. Okay, so Songhe, yeah, we'll do them first. Uh, this was in the last curriculum. These two were added this year. This is in the last year's curriculum. So Songhe, they're in West Africa. They're the ones that replace uh, Mali, uh, a declining Mali power. And they come out of the trade city of Gao. Uh, and that's in more of the uh, eastern portion. And they're going to conquer what is essentially what was Mali and take over that area. So a couple things are the same. The things that are the same, but they're going to be enriched by the Trans-Saharan Trade Network trade. And what are the most lucrative commodities over here in West Africa? Gold. Gold. Slaves, gold, ivory. Ivory, yeah. <coughs> Slaves, gold, ivory, just like the uh, Mali and uh, for them, Ghanis. But this is going to be the one difference. They are going to have Islam, just like Mali did. But what's the difference with Islam here? They don't enforce them in the lower class. Right. Uh, they're going to... Um, well, that's going to be the same, actually. Who did they enforce it on, though? The, 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 the elites, exactly. So before it was not enforced on anybody. Now it is enforced on the elites. So Askia the Great, one of the uh, most influential and powerful rulers there, great. He's part of this uh, program where they're going to force the elites, the wealthy people, or you can see the nobles, uh, to convert to Islam. But why? Why would he force force elites to convert to Islam? Why, 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 why? No hands for that. So they can, um, so they can have the Islamic government. Okay, but like how does that enhance the power of the monarch? Because Islam teaches to um, follow and obey the uh, leader. Yeah, exactly. If they're, if they're Muslim. Right, exactly. So if you have a Muslim ruler, you're supposed to obey that uh, uh, state hierarchy, right? And the whole reason for this, again, is to promote obedience to king, because that's part of Islam. If your ruler is Muslim, then you're supposed to adhere to that state hierarchy, because if, if it's a Sharia or a Muslim government, it's supposed to be a good um, and uh, virtuous government. All right, cool. All right, and then the Songhe, of course, are later going to um, fall because of a combination of the uh, fault in the trans hair tra trade network and the invasion of uh, Morocco into the, because they thought that they were wealthy, but they found out that the uh, gold had pretty much run out. It was pretty much just the slave trade at that point. All right, so with the Asante, down here was now modern day Ghana uh, on the Ivory Coast. They're gonna establish uh, an empire. Uh, one of their greatest rulers was Asay or Asai Tutu, and uh, their symbol of power isn't gonna be a scepter, it's actually the golden stool of the Asante. Uh, so the monarch that holds and possesses that is the uh, ruler of the Asante people. 
Uh, and they are going to do uh, rather well, isn't it? It's expand the state and reform the military. And again, they're going to be controlled by colonial powers later on, the French and the British, but uh, they do still maintain their own rulers uh, throughout most of that era. So uh, they're going to have, of course, the golden stool. And they are also, much like the Songhe, going to profit from uh, the slave trade, from slaves, ivory. I don't think they were as wealthy regarding gold, but I'm sure it was still present. All right, so slaves are every gold. I think copper too, uh, but uh, they're pretty much just going to benefit from trading with Europeans for the most part in the area. Uh, and that's the Asante Empire uh, kingdom. Got that? Yep. All right. And the, uh, at least the religious unifier of the um, kingdoms of the Congo was Mani Congo in 1491. I realize that precedes the 16th century because they weren't yet large, but... There was a group of Europeans that had already mapped out and explored and were establishing trade posts uh, along this coast here. Who would that be? Portuguese. Portuguese, right. And the Portuguese are going to bring Catholicism. And uh, after Mani Congo, the peoples of the Congo, in roughly this region here, are going to convert to Catholicism. So Catholics after contact with Portuguese. Remind me what the three motivations for Europeans to explore was. Gold, glory, and... <laughs> Converting people. Uh, God. God. God, yes, there you go. Gold, glory, God, right. Remember, the gold is to get wealthy, the glory, uh, God <laughs> is to um, missionary, missionary work to spread Christianity, and the uh, glory is for those, um, I think I told you this, those uh, in conquistadors that would go in and... They weren't like powerful lords in Europe, but if they conquered the area, they would get their own kingdom, uh, their own feudal kingdoms. That was the glory. All right, cool. Uh, and also, the Portuguese are going to, uh, of course, begin trading uh, slaves with them, but it already existed. There was already a trade network regarding slaves, just like in West Africa, who had been trading slaves with each other and with the Arabs for I mean, like a 500 years at that point. There was already an existing slave tra uh, labor market, although obviously the Portuguese... <coughs> coming in with their wealth uh, and purchasing slaves is going to enhance that. Uh, but we already know that. So Portuguese enhance an already existing slave trade. And they knew it already existed because of the first one of the first contacts, uh, this guy named Afonso, who was one of the kings of the Congo, uh, he's going to mention their uh, slave markets. Letters to Portuguese. Again, letting them know they have these slave markets and that the Portuguese are, of course, interested in purchasing those slaves later on. So those are the African states of the early modern era. Songhe, Asante, and uh, Congo in these three regions in West Africa and Central Africa. You guys giggity got that? <laughs> Sweet. So we move to the other ones pretty quickly because it's almost summarizing what we already know. So examples of syncretism in the early modern era, of course, which is when you are mixing local beliefs with these major religions like Christianity or Islam. Uh, so where's my, uh, the West Africans that are brought over to the Americas, especially in the Caribbean and uh, what is now the South, like Louisiana area? What's the uh, syncretism that's going on there? Voodoo. Yeah, the Vodun beliefs brought over from Africa, plus what? Christianity. Christianity. And uh, what are they going to borrow from Christianity and incorporate candles into their Vodun beliefs? Like candles. And yeah, candles, altars, uh, exactly. All right. What about in Africa and South Asia, the more mystical and spiritual uh, dance-centered, chant-centered, uh, uh, less reading liturgical Islam? Sufism. Sufism, yes. And that, of course, is going to be led by a Sufi, which is a mystical or spiritual leader. And you're going to want to know where these were popular. So again, this is going to be in the Caribbean and the Americas, more so the Caribbean, though. And this is going to be popular work. Southeast Asia. South Asia. Yeah. South Asia. Oh, Southeast Asia, too. So South and Southeast Asia. And Africa. Africa. All right, so that's syncretism. All right, as these religions spread, obviously. Okay, cool. Uh, next up on the list of stuff are... I thought I did literature next. Even if I don't, I'm doing literature next. So why are especially Europeans, but also Chinese... And also Ottoman, uh, Timars and whatnot. How come people are so much more easily able to afford luxury goods like art and literature? <coughs> Expansion of 
What? The Colombian exchange and everything. Oh, cool. So who got who got wealthy from this triangular trade Colombian exchange thing? Europeans. Europeans, yes. And then of course you already have uh, decently wealthy land empires. All right. So what are they doing with this extra wealth they've got to show how wealthy they are? Besides building grand architecture and, help and paint for portraits. Besides that. Playwrights. What? Uh, uh, Playwrights. Basically. Okay, they're hiring people to write plays. Okay, cool. Uh, what are some examples of some playwrights? Shakespeare. 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 Richard. Nice. So we got Shakespeare, Cervantes for Spanish, Shakespeare for English, obviously. Um, so they're going to be patronized. Well, who was a major patron of Shakespeare? So much Queen Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Yeah. Yeah. And again, the reason why we have wealthy, especially Europeans at the time, this gentry class, uh, back there, I'm going to kick you out in about five seconds and shut up. Thanks. So, Elizabeth uh, were uh, patrons, or sorry, she was a patron of, like, Shakespeare, and um, they're going to be wealthy because of this uh, exchange system. So it's going to be mostly gentry uh, and other merchant class folks across the world. Uh, are going to be enriched by triangular trade. All right. So that's literature. Speaking of literature, how does the Renaissance impact literature? Because obviously you got a bunch of old Greek and Roman stuff coming over from the Middle East and North Africa. How does that actually change the way people are writing and thinking and teaching? They use the printing press and spread it out. That's true. So, okay, all of this is going to be spread, including Renaissance works, yeah. Uh, spread faster and more cheaply via printing press. Nice. Okay. Um, what about literature, though, is going to change? It's going to shift from focusing on something to focusing on something else. Oh, so it's going to be more human humanism. It's going to be more humanism? It's going to be more human-like, where it's talking about more human and not more God. And okay, good. Ideas. You said human like five times a day. You think God never mix it up. Okay, cool. So, uh, Renaissance is going to uh, result in literary works and education centered around humanism. So, before we even talk about what that is, obviously there were humans in it. Uh, wh why all of a sudden is humanism going to pop up, this focusing on regular human people rather than like the divine or superheroes essentially. Uh, why is that going to be popular during this era when these other classical texts are coming back? Because of the new ideas and like uh, that really took away from the Catholic Church and the divine and everything else. Okay, that's true. Yeah. But like what about these Greek and Roman texts caused them to, you know, question it or, or, or move away from the Catholic Church and this whole divine perfection uh, focus? Okay, so skepticism, first of all, yeah, okay. So this is going to be uh, partially uh, pushed forward by skepticism from the Greeks and Romans. But also this too. Did they have Christianity back in the days of ancient Greece and the majority no, no. of ancient Rome? No, they did not. So they were focused a lot more on regular human and political life than they were about God or the afterlife or things like that. All right, so it's a very, what's called a secular tone. Secular meaning worldly. Not focused on uh, the afterlife, but focused on this life right here. That's what the Greeks were focused on. That's what most of the Romans were focused on as well. So, not only skepticism, but secularism. Remind me what secular means? Non-religious. Non -religious, worldly, exactly. So again, instead of having these figures that are either religious or divine or perfect, it's going to be very regular humans. So they're going to be the subjects of art, the subjects of writings, of stories, uh, stories that usually had like some meaning about you know how to get to heaven or how to become a perfect human or whatever. But now they're gonna be much more regular. Like oh, here's a criminal and a prostitute and a doctor and a liar, right? And here's them going on this adventure trying not to die from the Black Death, right? That's basically what the um, to Cameron was. So um, that's what uh, writing styles how they're going to evolve uh, in the Renaissance. We talk more about that in AP Euro, but that's how the Greco-Roman texts are going to influence and change literature. All right, that's covered. Next up is... We do Little Ice Age, Disruption. Oh, yeah, the other, one, other ways to demonstrate power. Actually, so I said no earlier, but I forgot that's actually a part of this too. So we mentioned we've got monarchs that are patronizing uh, art and plays, but we also have some examples that we've already covered before, but we can just sum them up. Uh, monarchs demonstrating power. 
power and wealth. All right, so examples of architecture. Give me a monarch and a building or a piece of architecture that embodies this. Palace of Versailles from uh, Louis XIV of yeah, France. Yeah, Versailles, Louis XIV of France. Absolutely. Almost bankrupts France doing it. Ivy the Terrible in the Winter Palace. Okay, it was actually Peter the Great, but yes. Oh, okay. Peter the Great. Remember, unless somebody's dying horribly, it's probably not... Um, wait, no. Yeah, unless somebody's dying horribly, it's probably not uh, Ivan the Terrible. All right, uh, Peter the Great, uh, Winter Palace. <clears throat> nice Eurocentric examples, guys. Jeez. What about some non-Europeans? Oh, my goodness. Taj Mahal, Shah Jahan, there you go. Mughal Empire. Okay, cool. So we got the... That's our, also architecture. So we have the Mughal. And we got the Taj Mahal. What about portraits? Mini. Mini portraits? Where? Ottoman, uh, Ottoman Empire. Who? Who? What oh, position? Cool. Sultans. Cool. Nice. Uh, in China, the big port uh, portraits. Of who? Uh, Emperor Kanji. There you go. So Qing. Life-size portraits, Ottoman, miniature port paintings. Nice. Okay. So uh, in this era, from 1300 to 1850, there's a cooling of the globe, a natural cooling of the globe. <clears throat> so if it's very, very cold up here in the north, you have a lot more ice form. Uh, winters are longer. You can't grow crops as well. Uh, certainly not this far north. You can't even grow crops at all for the most part. Uh, and then it's still growing crops in these regions, but they don't um, last as long, not as long around the year. So what is this era called? And uh, what's the impact on the populations up here in the north? The Little Ice Age and it results in like abandonment, abandonment of settlements up there. Nice, Little Ice Age. I should have written it over here, I should have point. The internet people are gonna hate that. Oh well. Little Ice Age, uh, and again, so people up in uh, northern territories are going to have to move or die because they can't grow either food at all or they can't grow it as, uh, throughout as much of the year. So what are some examples of settlements that had to be abandoned uh, to go for the south? Greenland, Iceland, and Norway. Nice. Okay. Greenland, Iceland, Norway, even Scotland up there in northern England, the northern part of the British Isles, Scotland, are going to abandon settlements to move south, or to the United States. Or, well, the colonies, anyway. So, this is when a lot of people end up going to the colonies, because, uh, well, they have to. If there's religious wars over here fighting and dying, or they're dying of starvation and, and freezing. In fact, in England, the Thames River uh, is going to uh, uh, freeze over a couple times completely, which doesn't happen. All right, and lastly, we also have some examples of social unrest, usually because of either too many taxes, or because of uh, the loss of common land rights. So, with the enclosure movement, they're kicking peasants off. They normally had the right to use the land as they pleased, as long as they um, paid their uh, uh, corvée labor, their land, their labor taxes. Uh, but in England, in the 16th century, there's a rebellion because so many peasants have been displaced. They aren't happy. They want things to change. They want their common uh, land rights protected. What is the name of that rebellion? Ketz Rebellion. Ketz Rebellion, right. Boom. And that's going to be a, um, an anti-enclosure rebellion. And again, they're losing their common land rights. I think I explained that in the study hall, but I can't remember if I did. Did I talk about the enclosure movement in the study hall? You did, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. And uh, what about an example where colonists are being deprived of resources because the Europeans, so specifically is going over here, because the Europeans are using those resources to fight against each other in Europe and across the uh, globe. Boston bread. Boston bread riots, yes. That's in the 1710s. All right, and that's uh, opposed resource Misuse. I'm totally off the brute grid here. I just realized this is the line too. Posed uh, resource misuse. Nice. That's anti enclosure rebellion. If you can't see it on the uh, video later. 
And lastly, we have a peasant rebellion in southern Japan due to increased tax hikes to pay for uh, fortification for the ports because they're starting to ban foreigners. Uh, now they're really going to ban foreigners after this one. What is that 1837 rebellion against the Tokugawa shogunate called? Shimabara. And what's the impact of that? They, they, they isolate themselves. The isolation yeah, they finalized the, what they're already beginning, that Sokoku isolation period, uh, at least by 1639. So Shimabara is going to be a uh, rebellion against Tokugawa taxes. And of course that's going to result in Japanese isolation, Sokoku. But, uh, why did they do that though? Why did they think that this in particular was an event in which they needed to close the Japanese off from the rest of the world. They'd already kind of initiated this process, but now they're like, yep, for sure. Why? Because the re re people that rebelled were Catholic and they thought that the Catholic influence caused them to rebel. Yep, they thought foreign influence and ideas uh, were causing unrest in a relatively peaceful Tokugawa uh, central state. <clears throat> so, that's it, bye. There's only a couple topics though. So, uh, who was my, if you remember, the because in Southeast Asia, the women ran the markets, which surprised a lot of Muslim and uh, European merchants when they got there. Uh, and some of them even had their own businesses and ships. Uh, what was the one example of a lady in Jakarta or uh, Indonesia that would uh, that had that? Anna Nzinga? Uh, no, close though. It was uh, Nia Gedi. All right. Who knew the uh, African lady who was a diplomat with the Portuguese? Um, how about... There was one group of women in the Muslim world that had some influence on the sultan, uh, whether they were family members or uh, like when they were the mother, for example. The imperial harem. Yeah, the imperial harem of uh, the Ottoman Empire. So it's not, sometimes they would rule as um, uh, like queen regents type thing, like if the sultan was too young or, or whatever, they would temporarily uh, rule for them. But they also, of course, had a, a direct connection with the uh, sultan being like, you know, either the mother or, or the wife, uh, or whatever. And the, uh, there was actually a title uh, called the Valid Sultan, which is the, the official, like, mother of the Sultan. So they had their own protection and uh, somewhat of a say, depending on the particular Sultan uh, in politics. But also, women in the Ottoman Empire had some property rights too, which was um, uh, rare in the Muslim world, uh, just the world in general back then. Uh, so yeah, that was some of the advances in power for women in period two.